It's like Charlie on Charlie's Angels. You never see him. He's Good evening. And welcome to the Monday, June 27th, 2022, Litchfield Board of Selectmen meeting. The board has just come out of a paperwork review. I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, it sounds good when there's a crowd. I know. <laughs> Before we get started with the agenda item this evening, I'd like to address some false accusations and misinformation that was put out on social media this weekend concerning the um, decoration on the Arcanian Lanes um, signage. Mm -hmm. Wednesday evening, I, rep I got two concerned re um, citizens report to me that they had a visibility and a distraction concern at the intersection of Arcadian Lane, and they said that a stop sign slash street sign was decorated. So I told both of them that I would allow, you know, I would, I would have somebody go look at it. So in the morning, I form a, excuse me, I did normal protocol. I informed the town administrator and the road agent to please go out, that we had a complaint, um, that there was a visibility issue and a distraction. And if the road agent did agree that there was and that there was signage that was decorated, to please remove it. The road agent went out there and did exactly that. He found that the decoration was on the pole. He took down the decoration. He brought it back to the highway department. The resident that put it up called him. He brought it back to her and explained the situation, and that's where it ended. At no time in any of these conversations was the word offensive ever used from the people that reported it or from anybody from this board, from the town administrator or the road agent. When we get a concern like that, we have to follow the statutes that are before us. And therefore, it's unfortunate that we had this complaint However, this complaint led to us having to do what we needed to do per the law. The road agent did his job and I did my job also. The protocol we follow is exactly the same. If somebody calls up and says there's a tree across the road, if there's kids stacking uh, picnic tables in the pavilion, we report it to the town administrator and the direct department head and they go off and take care of it. Anybody who would like to speak during public input concerning this will be welcomed at that time. The first item tonight is the review and approval consent items. We have the account payroll manifest of June 21st, 2022 in the sum of $55,015.37. June 28th, 2022 in the sum of $58,399.79. We have a payroll manifest of June 23rd, 2022 in the sum of $68,899.84. June 30th, 2022, in the sum of $61,427.34. A warrant for unlicensed dogs. The IRS mileage rate increased to 62 and a half cents. We have a denial of the American Towers property tax abatement. We have two land use change taxes, and we have the MS 535 2001 budget report. Are there any items members would like to be removed from consent? Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve? One question, Mr. Mr. Chairman. The IRS mileage rate, 62.5, shouldn't we vote on that? We should when it comes to the policy, right? There's a policy that refers to that, Troy? So we, we typically, the board normally will set that rate. It always uses the IRS rate, and it's uh -huh. always set in January. But due to the uh, situation that's going on right now with the fuel um, pricing, the IRS has set a special rate effective July 1st. Okay. So, um, you can take it up separately. You can remove that from consent. We can bring it up under other and just vote on it. But consent's fine as long as we have something on record that, that the board was aware of it. And uh, we've set it at 62.5. I think procedurally, mm -hmm. I think we should vote on it. Okay. So we can have that as an other business later on in the meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any other items? What's the American Towers tax abatement denial? The the denial is based on um, the assessors did not receive the information back that they're looking for. So at this point in time, you know, when, when people apply for an abatement, there's a certain amount of time that the town has to respond. And at this point in time, they feel the application is incomplete. So we, we, we deny it. 
and it puts the ball back in your court. Okay, we discussed this at an earlier meeting. We correct? did, yes. yes. Correct, yeah. <coughs> and they went back <coughs> trying to get more information and yeah. s still going back okay. and forth. Very well. Okay, anything else? Do we have a motion to approve? So, so move. We have a motion by Mr. LaSalas. Second. Second by Ms. Queenan. All in favor, Mr. Larry. Aye. Mr. LaSalas. Aye. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Ms. Queenan. Aye. I am also an aye. Motion carries 500. Do we have any other business that we'd like to add to the agenda this evening? Um, I did have a resident, I had a couple of residents that called about joining the CIP committee as citizens reps. Um, and I tried to get all the information that I could, but the one that I did get, was able to get was Connie Jackson, who lives on Cutler Road in Litchfield. Um, she would like to be on as a citizen's rep. I believe she was on the original list when they did interviews. I think she might have been. Yeah. yeah so I think she might have just missed. She well, she was on the original list. Um, she she had indicated that maybe something had come up and wasn't able to commit. So I'm not sure if that's changed now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she told me she's interested. So it's so. changed now. Yep. Okay. <coughs> May I add to that? Yeah, of uh, course. Ma Marion Colby also approached uh, today and okay. went to the town hall as well. Okay. But I think she did it online just now. Right. Very good. We go from none to two. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Public input will occur no earlier than 6.45 p.m. The first item of business is the June 13th, 2022 minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review and do we have any corrections or comments? Motion to accept. We have a motion by Mr. Larry. So second. Second by Mr. Lynch. All those in favor, Mr. Larry. Aye. Mr. LaSalas. Aye. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Ms. Queenan. Aye. I am also an aye. Motion carries 5-0-0. Next, we have Matthew Hoffman, alternate on Conservation Commission member, term to expire March 30th or 2025. Mr. Brown. Okay. Mr. Hoffman had applied to be a member of the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. He um, has met with the Conservation Commission. Chairman Brennan has notified us that um, they are recommending that he come on board, even though they have a vacant full member, uh, they want him to come on as an alternate right now and, and then uh, go from there. Okay, so. great. Matthew, come forward, if you'd like, please. Who's the vacant full-time member? Who, who left? Um, Matt, right? Yes. Oh, Matt, fourth yeah, spot? Okay. Four. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Could you just tell us a little bit about you, yourself? Um, sure. Well, I've been a, a resident of uh, Litchfield for uh, uh, about 26 years now. Um, you know, had my kids grow up in, in, in the town, spent a lot of time coaching, doing scouts, and that, that, that sort of stuff with them. And now the kids are older, so I'm looking for something else to do with my time. Um, I enjoy fishing, hiking, mm -hmm. uh, camping, you know, just, just being outdoors and, you know, uh, interested in the environment. Um, <coughs> I do have... Uh, some experience. I spent 10 years in the engineering unit in the National Guard uh, building roads and stuff, so I understand drainage and impacts on wetland and that sort of stuff, so I just feel like I have some good uh, uh, good resources I could pr provide to the commission. Uh, thank you. We're always happy when people step up to volunteer. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Mr. LaSalle? Make a motion we accept Matthew Hoffman. We have a motion by Mr. LaSalle. I'll second it. We have a second by Mr. Lynch. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Mr. Larry. Aye, Mr. LaSalas. Aye. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Ms. Queenan. Aye. I'm also an aye. Motion carries 500. All right. Thank, thank you. you and welcome. Thank you Thanks. very much. You'll have to work with him. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty easy. Really. <laughs> so, Mr. Hoffman, we'll have uh, the paperwork delivered to the town clerk's office tomorrow. So, okay. during any business hours, you can come in and take the oath of office. Great. Thank you. Okay. And you'll be good to go. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much. Appreciate it. Sure. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. I guess for the next we have is Bobby Jacques, Veteran Park Concept. Welcome. Good to have you, Bobby. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ooh, there's a big crowd here tonight, huh? I know. So I have a prepared statement, like I always do. If I could go ahead and read this to of you. Course. So tonight, as a as a veterans group, uh, first of all, I want to say um, give this board an update of what our group has been doing since we gathered together in October 2019 after an 18 month pause. Due to COVID, we got the group back together and began our journey to make a difference in the community which we call our home. After our initial meeting and working with a vendor in Boston, we uh, procured the flags with your help for 3A to keep Pat Jewett's vision alive. 
After much debate, numerous meetings and compromises with the cemetery trustees, we were able to convince them that it was uh, time to put American flags in our two cemeteries, and we held fundraisers to purchase the two beautiful 30-foot poles that now fly proudly over the veterans who rest there. With our team of veterans, some of which are here tonight, and some great Litchfield uh, citizens, we were able to install them at Pinecrest and the Hillcrest cemeteries. We extended our flag program by having them fly from Recycle Way to the corner of Albuquerque and Hillcrest, and this past Saturday we moved forward and placed additional flags from the fire station to the corner of Pinecrest. We had a great scholarship committee, Rich was one of the great people here, who worked with the school guidance department and awarded two $1,000 scholarships for the military and one for the trades, which we think was a very total success. We have a committee that is working with REITs across America where we will be able to procure REITs for the 110 veterans that, that lie within the two cemeteries. And this will happen on 17 December through 18 January. This is a coordinated effort with the cemetery uh, committee. However, we, are, we were approached by Mrs. Robin Corbeil and she teaches unifying arts at LMS and, and they wanted to involve the students and the parents to help support this effort. They did a cornhole tournament and through their efforts they raised over $700 and they will do others in the fall. As part of this effort, the Reese Across America has an educational program which her students will be engaged in, and when the REITs arrive, they will be part of the placement within the cemeteries, which I believe is a, and we all believe is a true partnership. Our most recent success is our first annual Litchfield, New Hampshire Golf Classic. We saw a lot of the people back here. Maybe we can get them to golf with us next year. Uh, be, and so mark your calendar for 24 May 2023 for our second annual tournament. Our latest event that we would like to bring to this board is to propose another veterans group project to redevelop the current gazebo area across the way and rename it Veterans Park. Uh, you know, and you, and you kind of come down here and I think the name of this street is, uh, what is? Liberty Way. Liberty, Liberty Way. Way, right? So, so what, a, what a great thing. So we plan and organize by the group of Litchfield Veterans Group. We believe that our division would be to include a newly designed gazebo open to the public with some guidelines in place to ensure its success and upkeep. The vision also includes the addition of a larger gazebo area, granted benches in order of the veterans of each conflict, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the War on Terror. We're working with the people just trying to get a design up in Concord, New Hampshire, so we could kind of put that together. It, this will be a place for families and groups to have fun, but never forget our veterans. That was the most important thing. Like I said earlier, name only. If we can get your approval, we'll bring back to the board a design for your review, as well as the citizens of our great community. Our goal is to have uh, this completed by 15 June 2023 uh, with a dedication ceremony, having our 30 by 50 flag that Rich wanted to keep over to his house blowing <laughs> in the wind. Is there any questions from the board? I love it. Is I this think something that needs idea. to be a citizen's warrant because we're doing something on town property? It, um, it's on town property, so the board of selectmen are the overseers of property. Okay. And like I've talked to Bobby about this, that it's good to have a lead uh, group that's going to be in charge of it, but I think it's important that the board of selectmen endorse it and that um, the community is involved. And I think that's your goal and objective yes. is to have the community yes. involved every step of the way. Yeah, exactly. Because it's going to be a community park right. for people to gather. Right. Just enjoy Litchfield. Right. But also remember our veterans. Exactly. Okay. That's what we want. Who installed the the gazebo that's there now? Well, I understand the um, town <coughs> clerk, Terry Brian. My, my understanding is that she was able to apply for a grant through Coca-Cola. And okay. that's what um, oh, it was, was part of was that. able to get funding. Right. And then it was all volunteers that, that constructed the, the uh, area one weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the pavers and everything else is open. So at this point, who maintains it? The highway department cuts the grass around it. There's some volunteers mm -hmm. that will come and do some bark mulching, put some Adirondack chairs around. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of the just volunteers on their own initiative uh, uh -huh. maintain, put flowers out, do some work like that. Okay. We've had some Eagle Scouts do some projects uh, with the public safety uh, mm -hmm. you know memorial so yeah the the memorial opposite the fire station for first responders first responders is part of the park right yep, yep. okay okay <clears throat> i think it's a great idea Run it by the planning board mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well I, and that, that's a good point because i do think 
uh, a project like this, you, you know, uh, a good way, a good way to make sure it's gone through a public process and all interested groups, citizens can have some input, is to do an informal application through the planning board process. Okay. We can do that. Mm. For safety. Well, well it's just general it's input. Very general input. It's yeah. normal tell them construction we go through. It's not you really know. necessary to go that. You know, I don't, I don't want to open up, but I mean, I think the goal <laughs> might be one day that you could have some concerts, um, uh, you know, some, some entertainment on yeah. in the area, and it, that allows a, a process where people oh, can talk good. about hours of operation, lights, and stuff like that. Just, it's a, it, it's yeah. such a positive project, you, you want to make sure that communication is done every step of the way. And the tool can be used for the commissioners' fellowship. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It would just be a bigger thing. It would just be a bigger, uh, right now, we, we didn't get permission to do what we did out there, just came to the town and did it. Yeah. And that's how it's going to grow. Mm -hmm. Planning board is not a, not a legal function here. You want to show no, them what you're doing, sure, that, yeah. no, but it's, it's, it, okay? It's got a good process in place yeah. to, to be able to officially have public comment. And, um, okay. So I, I just think that's it's a good process to go through. <coughs> I think all municipal projects should go through. So once we get the design, we go to um, board board, right? come back here again. I come back to the board of selectmen, and, right? Uh, and then go the and then go to the planning board after kind of work that through that whole process. But everybody can have that input, right? Yeah. I, I'd like to see it so we could get it. We, we we talked about that as a group that we could put it on the TV and people can get a, an input and see how it, how it's how it's going to come together because I think it's important that we do that. So we really want to don't forget our veterans of what we're doing. So that's yeah. important. So. It's going to be for the town, but we just want to be called Veterans Park because there's many organizations at, at different towns that have that. So, okay. yeah, I, I think that's the best thing. Yeah. Let's do it. Yep, I think it's great. Okay. Mm, thank you for all your efforts. Oh, yep. got one more Go thing. On. One more Go thing, on. if I could. Okay. Finally, as our Litchfield, New Hampshire veterans group was was developing, uh, I consulted, if I may, uh, with our current town administrator, which I had never met prior regarding how our group could be established. Now, he schooled me on a lot, but through his guidance and vision, we worked together. Sometimes we had some discussions that at times were hard for me to understand. Uh, much discussion about the process, the ways of, to move forward with some of our present successes. And I would kind of refer back. Uh, he schooled us on the ways things has to get done. After working myself with three-star generals, it was new and different. To say this, to say this, well, the things that we talked about, uh, but due to his support, we've been successful. We will miss his guidance in the future. Through it all, we are still talking to each other, and hope that that continues even when he moves forward. With that said, we know Troy Brown will be leaving the helm, so our Litchfield, New Hampshire veterans group would like to make a presentation to him. In the military, when someone does something special before they leave. We usually recognize him, him or her for their contribution and their service. I now call on top Bill Dugan to call all the veterans to attention and ask Mr. Brown to stand as I read the citation. <clears throat> citation of Appreciation presented to Troy Brown, Town Administrator, Litchfield, New Hampshire. This flag, John, was flown over Pinecrest and Hillcrest cemeteries in honor of your unwavering support and guidance to the Litchfield, New Hampshire Veterans Group, signed by myself, Chief Master Sergeant, retired Bobby Jocks, Litchfield, New Hampshire Veterans Group, 27 um, of June 2022. Do you want to present it to you guys? Troy. We Brian's going to get in here too. Brian, you want to get in with the certificate? Yep. Both of you get, get Johnny, you get on one side. Brian, you get okay. <laughs> one, <laughs> get in the middle. Get him in the middle. Right? <laughs> it's easy to say it that way. There you go. <laughs> and on the back of the flag, all the veterans here tonight, except for Rich Lasalas, because we didn't get him, but, but he'll sign the back of that. That's for you saying thank you for all you did for us. We appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Bloody 
Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for all your work. Appreciate it. Troy, do we go to the center this way? Troy, should we go to the library or which one's going to be? Um, Bobby wants to watch the center this. I do the library. I think it's quick. Oh, the library's quick? Okay. Just one more, guys, please. Next, we have library trustee pavilion project. Mr. Brown. All right, so at our last meeting, uh, you, you probably recall that I gave you some background on our discussion about the library trustee's desire to build a pavilion. And this probably started a good year and a half or so ago when they came forward to this board and asked if they could use impact fees to construct the pavilion. We reached out to Bruce Mayberry, who was the um, consultant used to generate the, the methodology for um, calculating impact fees and, and how they were to be used. It was in his opinion that we could not use the impact fees because it really didn't provide additional space for the library. Well, the library, being uh, researchers, um, didn't accept that answer and they, they worked with our legal counsel and uh, provided information. Our legal counsel came back with, well, that's still not enough documentation for me, but if you can give me information X, Y, and Z, then I'll uh, reconsider. And they did a lot of research, and to get Laura Spector Morgan to change her mind, uh, you did a fantastic job. <laughs> and uh, Laura is <coughs> fully prepared to defend anyone's argument that this wouldn't be appropriate use of impact fees. So. I brought that to the board's attention last uh, meeting, asking them to authorize the, the, uh, the funds for this purpose. And I think they had some questions just in general uh, about the pavilion project, and I, that's why we're here this evening. Yeah, I think we just wanted to see the correspondence and the questions that were asked. It's, I think it's a great use of the funds. They're making more space, and I, th I think it would look really nice over there. Since I can't expand the building, it's the next logical f solution. <clears throat> but currently, the, you have a tent there, yeah. right? Yeah. Would the pavilion kind of mimic the footprint of the tent? Yes, but not in that location. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't be right up against the road. Okay. It would be further back? It would be, um, <laughs> as we try to orient ourselves, here's the road. Yeah. It would be on the side fence okay. um, towards the parking lot. Okay. Very good. Great spot. Right. <clears throat> that's why they mentioned that you think you have to remo remove one tree or? Yeah, okay. correct. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. That'd be a Better to get it off more the green, road. <laughs> you're leaving more yeah. green space. Right. Yeah. Less noise. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that tree is getting old. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, so are you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plant it. <laughs> I, I just had an observation, that's all. I, I was the one who raised the question because mm -hmm. it really, the way the contract was written, it was supposed to be attached to the building. And then I just wanted to see the justification of how not. Because if, we, uh, if we're not stringent with our impact fees, then somebody else is going to come in and say, well, they got away with it and they didn't follow. So I just wanted to see that correspondent. Do I think it's a good idea? Yes. And do I support it? Yes. The only thing from being on the planning board I will say is when I looked at the quote here, and it's it's a good quote, but just sometimes things do have a cost overrun. I see you have a slab going in and all of that. Right. Just to, just to be aware, I think you have the forty that. something thousand, yeah. but you're spending thirty one thousand. It, it you, you have to might go back be to bid. <laughs> raw materials are getting crazy. Yeah. yeah. So just be aware, engineering inspections, you know that kind of. And to be ready if it went over 10, 15, 1,000, just double the time, triple the cost. I'm <laughs> getting a look. But whatever it is, I just want you prepared for that. Right, right. Because you have a limited money. Yeah, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Besides, um, how many months of the year do you anticipate being able to use it? Well, certainly all the months without snow, but our children's <laughs> librarian also has plans for things that we could do with snow. Um, okay. have, um, some family activities outside and then being able to have hot cocoa and stuff under the pavilion and 
Let's it's make a nice little thing. There we go. Put, we'll invite you for that. Yeah, okay. I'll go. <laughs> Is there any idea to put like removable sides on it or leave it to heat the space? Um, a couple extra months out of it. Yeah, we had hadn't thought about like um, wooden sides. No, wooden, but, but had, just removable. Even if right. It's we had, sides, so yeah, we had talked about um, talked about the canvas mm -hmm. so that if it were. Um, Real sunny, we could block some sun, or if it, the rain was slanting, we could yep. block some rain. But yes, um, obviously, there's probably not enough money initially, but mm -hmm. that is something we'd like to look into. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Canvas is a part of a popular thing with these things. Uh, certain seasons for wind, mm -hmm. stuff like that, rain coming on, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It does work well. Mm -hmm. Today, you can put a, a, a you fire spoke pit in. Have you spoken to your contractor? Is this something that could be constructed by this fall, or is this um, a no? I haven't. You're looking at? I haven't spoken to him again. <laughs> the reason I bring it up, and, and again, it's just my recommendation, is that um, it, is that again you you consider going as a courtesy review to the planning board um, to talk about the location, the size, and allow that process again allows public comment allows department heads to, to review the plans you know the fire department police department building inspector and um, I just think it's always a good process instead of pouring the concrete and having someone raise some issue and we're kind of already committed right uh, to what we've done you know I just feel it's a, it's a way to help eliminate those surprises makes perfect sense but if yeah. you're like Mm -hmm. It's a tough <coughs> schedule. To, I don't know how they'd be expedited. If you were looking. Yeah. You could expedite it because yeah. it's not a complex one. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like not a. It's a shed. <laughs> it still requires a building permit and, and stuff. Yeah, but it doesn't. Slab, yeah. It's <laughs> questionable whether it's a That's site basically. plan limit. So, but it's a good. I just think it's a really good, healthy process. Okay. okay. It's considered a structure, so yeah. Yeah. But everything with a mm -hmm. floor had to be mm -hmm. continued. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to encumber $31,135 to construct a pavilion at the Aaron Cutler Memorial Library. We have a motion. We have a motion by Mr. Larry, second by Mr. Lynch. Any further discussion? Aye. All those in favor, Mr. Larry? Aye. Mr. LaSalas? Aye. Mr. Lynch? Aye. Ms. Queenan? Aye. I am also an aye. Motion carries 500. Great. Great. Thank Good you. Thank you. <laughs> if you need help, let us know. We will do. Okay, well, thank you so much. You'll ask me. Difference in your mates, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next item we have is Richard Olson Jr., Londonderry Fish and Game Club President. Mr. Brown. Well, as you recall, at our last meeting, we had residents from Tanner Jaway, Heron, um, here talking about some issues that they're concerned about with uh, bullets being found on property and uh, a building being struck. Um, so there was conversation that took place some some uh, you know some individuals really made uh, uh, claims that they felt they were coming from the uh, London Area Fish and Game Club uh, Mr. Olson had heard about this I think he's watched the YouTube video he contacted Selectman LaSalas and asked you know we'd, we'd like to be able to come in and address the board um, and Richard re reached out to us so I've spoke to Mr. Olson at length. We had a good conversation, and uh, he's, you know, he's here this evening to uh, at least make you aware of Londonderry Fishing Game Club, what they what they do out there, and, and how they uh, uh, and answer any questions that you have. Um, so, with that. Thank you and welcome. Thanks a lot. Um, well, uh, for the before I toss it over to Sean here. Um, my name is Richard Olson. Uh, I currently reside in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, grew up in Derry. Have been a member of the London Derry Fish and Game Club. I was a junior member in 1977. Uh, and uh, being a member of the club back then, I can tell you the footprint and what was in the area was very drastically different from what's here today in the surrounding area. Um, in fact, uh, as a youth, I used to deer hunt where a lot of these houses are now. Um, uh, I had, after I graduated from high school, I entered the United States Marine Corps. During my time in the Marine Corps, uh, I operated 
uh, the Echo Range uh, Weapons Training Battalion, Paris Island, where we're responsible for funneling recruits uh, approximately uh, 125 a day through the range uh, two weeks out of the month. So, that, you know, that's a lot of shooting. That's a lot of range control. I did that for 18 and a half months. Uh, I was sent to Marine Corps Development Education Center, Quantico, Virginia, at a later time, where I operated their development range and their analysis range uh, for a period of 22 months. Uh, I operated the bombing, gunnery, and ordnance range uh, that was situated off the east end of Vieques Island, Roosevelt Roads Naval Station, Puerto Rico, uh, while I was assigned to the Marine Detachment there. Um, when I changed my status as a Marine to reserve status, I was employed as a Deputy Sheriff in Cheshire County and a part-time police officer in Dublin, New Hampshire. Uh, during that time, I became a firearms instructor, uh, teaching other, or working with other police officers uh, in some cases, teaching them um, how to properly handle and employ firearms in the conduct of their duties. Um, so that's what I'm all about. I brought with me today our club attorney, Sean List. And the reason I brought Sean is um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about having a sit-down meeting with the residents and folks, but um, sad as it is, there's already been a letter sent from an attorney uh, threatening a lawsuit so that kind of puts our dimension in a whole different category so primarily what we want to do here today is give you information information I don't believe that you folks had or information that was largely correct or even false and we're here today to correct that information so that everybody's working at the same place and with that I'll turn it over to uh, attorney Sean List sure so uh, certainly the club appreciates the opportunity to speak with the board and uh, I know it's kind of a strange issue to be in front of the board so uh, after we all you know reviewed the testimony provided last week uh, we would have been remiss to not weigh in and explain our side of things so before before you start thinking oh we're just gonna hear a bunch of legal jargon from you know this lawyer let me just explain a little bit about my background so I'm also a member of the club I've been a member of the club for several years in my law practice I primarily represent the firearms industry apart from that I myself am a firearms instructor I'm a competitive shooter I've testified as an expert witness pertaining to firearms related issues particularly the intersection with legal liability now I tell you all of this because there have been some very significant pertinent facts that haven't been considered when talking about the allegations that have been made against the club. So I, I want to, I'll try to stay organized and go through um, some various things that I think the board should consider, but I want to start out by just giving you one fact, okay? In order for a 7.62 by 3.9 millimeter projectile to have left Londonderry Fish and Game and impacted Tanager Way 1.3 miles away, the ballistic math demonstrates that someone would need to be shooting 900 feet above the berm. 900 feet into the sky at the clouds. Now, I've passed out correspondence between myself and the Angel's lawyer. There was never a discussion where, you know, we told the Anktles or their lawyer that we would bankrupt them with appeals if they brought legal action. No, we received a letter in December of 2021 where they said, stop using the 200, 400 yard range in 10 days or we're going to sue you. So in response, I laid out all the facts. I did what I do in all sorts of firearms related cases provided the ballistics data. It doesn't make sense. And let me be clear about one point. A huge part of my job, particularly in the political climate we're in today, is instructing clients, if they're facing real liability, right, how to resolve those situations. This is the type of situation where a projectile 
and the ballistics data is included in that letter, a projectile leaving the muzzle at 22,350 feet per second, that's the average, based on this type of bullet, 7.62 by 3.9, 123 grains, out of the type of firearm that the State Police Forensic Lab says it came out of, you know, an AK or SKS Ruger variant with a 16-inch barrel, that is what it would take for that projectile to travel from our range to their property. And the second projectile that was tested and recovered, same exact thing, 762 by 39, 123 grains. That is not a long range cartridge. That is an intermediate cartridge. And just to try to, to visualize ballistics in an easy to understand way, so if this pen is a rifle barrel, right? What you're talking about with ballistics is how far does the bullet travel before it hits the ground? Because it hits the ground the same exact way, right? So when you talk about long distance projectiles, 338 Lapua, 50 BMG, those are the types of projectiles that can travel this distance based on still a drastic but a miscalculation. To say that these projectiles came from Londonderry Fishing Game is to say that someone didn't screw up on their scope, but was pointing a rifle barrel somewhere between 35 and 45 degrees into the sky. Why did legal action not occur? It's not because we threatened to bankrupt them. That's outrageous. I would never say that. We don't want to spend money on lawyers. You know, I'd rather be talking to you guys just as a regular club member. No, it was because their lawyer from Wadley, Star and Peters, who I happen to respect greatly, understood there's no liability here. Not only is there no likelihood the bullet came from us, the, the evidence demonstrates almost definitively that it did not. So I want to lead with that just so that you can understand at no point during any investigation was an actual ballistic calculation done. And at exhibit A of the letter to their lawyer, you can see that exact calculation. Now, we would have loved to have had an informal, an informal conversation about what occurred. The problem is, is that we learned about the allegation two ways, through the police department and hearing our names just smeared through the media. It was horrific. I mean, we're, we're not just a group of rednecks in the woods. You know, we're former law enforcement, current law enforcement, military, doctors, lawyers, people in special operations groups. We're not just dinglings running around in the woods. We're guys that take this very seriously. And we take safety very seriously. So they never reached out to us. We learned about it through the media. And I don't know if the board has received copies of the police reports, but the time, have you received copies of the police reports? Yeah. So the timeline of events then you could see, on September 14th, the Anktles discovered a broken window. No projectile was recovered on that date, despite Mr. Anktel and Officer Rasmussen searching for a projectile. Even without a projectile being discovered, two things were immediately opined by the Anktels. Number one, that it was a bullet that hit their window. Number two, that it was a bullet from Londonderry Fish and Game that hit their window. They showed up at the police department that night making that claim. Multiple times in the media, Mr. Anktel has said that this bullet struck a window just a few feet from where he was sitting. If you look at the police reports, you can see they're actually not even sure what time or when that bullet struck the window. So if he was a few feet away, you'd think you would hear glass shatter. We waited until the investigations were complete to draw our conclusions. We didn't receive that same courtesy from the other side before we even had copies of the police reports, before we even knew what the caliber was of this bullet, right? We were already being just scorched in the media. And I'll tell you, if the caliber of that bullet was different, if it was a projectile or projectiles that could have arced that 1.3 miles, there'd be a different conversation entirely. But I can look at that and no, definitively, that didn't come from us. The idea that there's been four other bullets or five other bullets that have been harvested from the yard, 
right, using a metal detector. Well, I can tell you that precision ammunition is typically ferromag or it's not ferromagnetic. It's not magnetic. It's made of aluminum, brass, lead, and copper. You can't even detect it with a metal detector. What you can detect, though, is really low-grade military surplus 762 by 39, right? Because it's steel jacketed. This is not ammunition you see fired at a 200, 400 yard range, but even if it was, again, someone would have to shoot at the sky. Now, I'm not going to go much further into the ballistics. The data is right there in front of you. What I will say is, even if someone did shoot 900 feet into the sky, by the time that projectile, so it leaves the barrel at you know, 2,350 feet per second, by the time it travels 400 yards, the way that what's known as the ballistic coefficient works with 762 by 39 is that at 400 yards, it's already lost more than half of its velocity. At 600 yards, it's not even supersonic anymore. And I would add more in colder temperatures. True. True. It's even slower in colder temperatures. So if someone were to fire this round up into the sky, pointing their gun barrel at the sky so that the bullet could hit the ankles or hit 41 Tanager, by the time it got there, it would be traveling at under 500 feet per second. So um, slower than your average modern pellet gun. So these facts matter. But what also matters is, you know, we heard the Angtels talk about that the police said, the bullet was probably from Londonderry Fish and Game. It was likely from Londonderry Fish and Game. That's not contained in any police report. In, in fact, the Londonderry Police Department specifically found it was possible, right? Didn't say it was likely or possible, or likely or probable. Now, there is an ongoing understanding of the issue with people shooting in the musquash shooting in the power line corridor, shooting on public land. When I'm not doing firearms litigation, I actually represent the Speaker of the House. I'm at the legislature constantly. And I can tell you that it is something that comes up almost every session. This session, there was a bill that Sharon Carson, um, she tried to change essentially the preemption statute, RSA 15926, to allow the regulation of public property by local government subdivisions specifically because of shooting that has occurred in the musquash, right? You look at the Litchfield police reports and there was a report of a bullet striking someone's pool in June or July of 2020. Uh, Mark Cloutier, it was his residence, Six Heron Drive, right? He didn't even attribute that bullet strike to Londonderry Fish and Game. He said, I hear people shooting in the woods near my house all the time. I can tell the difference between gunshots 1.3 miles away and gunshots near my house, right? All it takes is to, to walk in the power line corridor or those areas around the musquash that are accessible and you find targets, you find casings. I mean, we had guys that walked the power line corridor and found 762 ammunition right? Cartridges. It's, it is not rocket science regarding where this stuff is likely coming from. The people who are going to hit people's houses are going to be the same people that don't care about joining a club and shooting at a berm. They're just setting up makeshift targets and shooting. There are plenty of instances of people's homes being hit with bullets all around the state that are not near a gun club. Everywhere from you know, Rochester to Bow to Rye, Northampton, this is not an uncommon thing. It is uncommon to have the source be a gun club. And frankly, the scientific data, again, it doesn't support the two projectiles at issue here being from Londonderry Fish and Game. The other important thing is, is that, you know, they've made this point that, oh, all these bullet strikes have occurred you know, in the last seven or eight years since the 200-400 opened. The 200-yard range opened November 20th, 2017. The 400-yard range opened 
a pretty significant amount of time after that. How many months would you say after I, that? I'd say two months. It was cold. I remember that. Pretty doggone cold. It was the middle of, uh, I think it was January of uh, 2018 when we officially opened it, deemed it available for use. So these, you know, alleged bullet strikes that occurred since the range opened, right, but occurred in 2015 and 2016, there's no possible way. They came from the 200, 400-yard ranges. And let me just tell you, the 200 and 400-yard ranges are the least used ranges in the entire club. That's just how it is. And the people that shoot out there are guys like me. You know, I go out there with a $12,000 rifle and I practice for precision matches. There was two rock crushers in those areas at that time. And because we had, we, we, had, we got an alteration of terrain permit through the <coughs> DES when we built that because we lowered the terrain 28 feet. Okay. And uh, we had to do a lot of blasting. We had a lot of surplus material. So, you know, we cut deals with some contractors that were building the hotel and building the condos across the river. Uh, you know, if you, you bring a rock crusher and crush it, it's yours. Uh, they took, they come in, they crushed it, they took it out. Uh, it, it was a win-win for them and us. So we, we, I think we moved 8,000 metric tons of material. If you have a concept of how much that really is, it's just, it's a lot of material. Um, and, um, that's that that was part of our construction process so i'm, I'm sorry no, no that's fine um and, and part of the reason that that's important is so there's purportedly been elevation studies that have occurred well i can tell you the topographical maps and the elevation um you know survey materials that were used to determine the differences in elevation did not take into account that those the shooting lanes are actually blasted right so the reason that you've got berms on the left and right side and completely at the end is because th there was, I mean, the elevation was dropped up to 31 feet in some places. Now, to try to be as conservative as possible, the ballistic analysis that I did still assumes that there's a 50-foot drop, more than a 50-foot drop, even though that is not the case. Could I interrupt you for sure. a second? With respect to elevation, when you talk, uh, are you talking about <clears throat> at the target end or at the other end? The whole thing. Okay. Right. So the, <clears throat> where you shoot, mm -hmm. is that above or below the target? It's below. It's below. So, and then <clears throat> where we have Tanager Way, is that above or below? Below about 20 feet. Okay, so 20 to 25 when feet. you did your ballistics mm -hmm. report or your analysis, did you take that into consideration? Because if I did, if the person is uh, uh, that's shooting is below the target, so he actually has to aim uphill. Mm -hmm. And the if Tanager Way is below where the target is then the bullet would be going downhill. Absolutely, I took that 100% into account. Okay. It's a 900 feet, you'd have to aim 900 feet above the target that you're trying to hit at 1.3 miles. So if it's a 50 foot difference, then we're talking still about 850 feet into the sky. And the way that the, the layout of the actual 400 yard shooting range is, right, is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, but in the middle of the path you would drive on in no man's land, that's really the lowest point. There's a higher point in the shooting area and then, or sorry, in the, the berm area as well as in the shooting area. And here's the thing. So uh, they're, they're, the idea that the shooting area is higher than the berm area is wrong, but apart from that, the idea that somehow there's only going to be six to 10 feet of berm based on a shooting platform that is higher, that doesn't make any sense because the target you're shooting at is going to be at the bottom of the berm, not completely level at that point. 
And I can tell you that there are a lot of ranges that are actually constructed like that on purpose. The reason being is it's considered safer to have the barrel pointing down at a target that's low than it is you would never want to shoot you know, up an extreme hill. But my initial reaction when I saw the more than a mile away with trees almost the entire way, mm. I said, there's no way a bullet is going to survive going through those trees. Correct. But then when you take into consideration the elevation, and if a person, if when they shoot, they go over the berm for whatever reason, they go over the berm, then that, that bullet is going to be above the tree. Would you agree with that? I would not. You would not? I would 100% not agree with that. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good information to know. Yeah. Now, I got your your latest note, Rick, and I noticed in there that, that you had some empathy for the people on mm -hmm. Tanager Way. And I think when they came in to visit with us last meeting, they're... They're obviously concerned about their children, their family, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I would like to propose to you, if at all possible, is let's take the blame out of it completely. Let's take expense out of it completely. And would the club then, not, not concerning any blame, but make some modifications, not, not necessarily to satisfy the people on Tanager Way, but for instance, and, and I don't know if this is possible, but I had a, I had a conversation with an abutter on the other side. It's somewhat of an industrial area. You folks know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and he said he would have no problem if you reversed the range, the 200 and 400. I thought we were talking about no expense, though. He would, right? su he would supply any extra material that you had, okay? And I'm, I, I, again, I, I'm just throwing these things out. The, the biggest issue that pops right out is that what happens when their, their houses get hit with bullets again because of this constant reckless shooting that's going on out there. Well... I mean, this is, I've got piles upon piles upon piles of testimony in the legislature, right, of Tom Dolan back in 2015 when Londonderry passed an ordinance, which has done nothing to stop the shooting in that area. Um, he said people are shooting in all directions, they're shooting everywhere, it's reckless, it's dangerous. We, we need more, we need more policing at the Musquash and also in the Litchfield Forest. Absolutely. Yeah. Which which they're adjoining also. Mm -hmm. So that has nothing to do with you, but I think that it makes sense for us as a town to have that policing, to have more signage in those areas. It, it's a cost. We understand that. You know, it's a cost to the taxpayer to have that happen. Well, one thing I, I want to do is talk about the range. I want to clarify something. I think there's we've gone down a path where people don't understand how this is constructed so w we have pages of engineer drawings that were done by a new hampshire state certified engineer uh, so that 400 yard range it is it's level grade out to i think it's 140 yards level level grade from the shooting position out it's it's level grade and then for i think it's 40 feet there is a I think 1.3 percent grade drop down to the swale because we had to do wetlands mitigation we have box culverts we have an hs20 load rated bridge uh, that crosses that so it crosses the swale and then for another i believe it's i can't don't hold me to this i believe it's another 60 feet it's level to grade and then at the at the shooting area, it's actually an upward incline. Okay, the rationale being that while we have 28 feet of berm, the incline increases that height. So 
what the sergeant in Londonderry did was he got it backwards, you know. Um, and I, I'll, I'll be perfectly frank with you. Nobody came out. Nobody called me and said, hey, can I tour your range? Hey, can I come look at your range? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have open doors. We've got nothing to hide. We'll show you all our ranges. Glad to. We'll talk about how they're constructed. We'll talk about how we monitor our berms, how we look at um, hydrology, you know, moisture content, what that means in terms of compaction, because when a, a berm compacts, okay, a terraform berm compacts, that means you're losing height. We, we have to monitor that. We, we built those to a specific height for a reason. Okay. You, we spent seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on that on those two ranges. That's a lot of money for a club like ours, and in doing so, we factored in we we factored in the management of projectiles staying on our property. I I just you know <clears throat> I I want you to to approach this from a standpoint of having empathy for those folks that, that live there. And they're being hit. I, I think we all agree that, that there have been bullets. They have evidence that there are bullets. Where they're coming from, I don't think it matters. You know, if it hits a kid in the eye, that's gonna be a tragedy. So, you But know, we're dealing with facts here. I understand that. I mean, that's that's the problem is we can do whatever, you know, whatever feel-good measure possible, but it's not going to stop this from occurring. And if we had been called at the outset, I could tell, you know, in the past, like, for example, there was an, an individual, a business, that had a projectile fly through their lunchroom window, right? Immediately called the club. Oh, my God, it's you guys. It was completely irate. The guy cussed me out like you wouldn't believe. Right. And we it didn't make Probably any sense. Sailor. Probably a sailor. Well, it didn't, it didn't make any sense <laughs> where he was located. <laughs> and sure enough, in short order, the police found the individuals who were shooting on public property recklessly and arrested them. And there are circumstances that have occurred like that throughout history. And the problem is, is that we are empathetic. In fact, if you know, we took it incredibly seriously and it wasn't until we saw specifically what the caliber was of the only two projectiles that have been tested um, that anyone has seen, uh, you know, that we could, we could say definitively they didn't come from the ranch. It's just the math does not work. That's why their lawyer did not take the case. This it's is because math. This is all math. It's just you know, math. It's distance and, and It's and just and how far velocity. can that projectile fly? It cannot go 1.3 miles. These circumstances, like in Skituit, Mass, right, there was a rod and gun club there that was peppering a neighborhood with bullets. That... Rod and Gun Club was 0.4, less than 0.4 miles away. And there is not public shooting in that area. And less than 0.4 miles away from Tanager Way is the power line corridor. That if you, I, I implore you guys to walk down that corridor and see there are shell casings everywhere. This is not, these are not projectiles, I can emphatically say, that are coming from London Dairy Fish and Game. If there was any, qu my entire life centers around figuring out firearms liability. And if there was any, any possibility that there was liability for London Dairy Fish and Game for these projectiles, I would not be at this board. For the love of God, I would not be letting Rick talk. Okay? <laughs> We're here because this is the, the situation at hand is, is that these projectiles, plainly, the math does not work. They didn't come from us. No. If they had called us, we would have looked at them and told them that. And we would have gone to their house. Yeah, we would have tried to figure out where it came from. Yeah. You know what we, I mean? And, you know, we're the type of guys, too, that if they said we can't afford this window that just broke, even though we didn't do it, we would have pitched in and bought them a new window because we're good community members. You've got over, I mean, what's the total number? We have 1,500 members. Yeah, I was going to say 1,500. 1,500 people from all walks of life. And we're not moral monsters that are just saying, we're not gonna do anything about this. If we were the cause, we would. We're simply not. And we've been pushed to this point where now we've been blasted through the media. And when you're dealing with a highly political issue like firearms, we're now seriously considering whether it's time for us to initiate litigation regarding the ongoing defamation of the club, because it is outrageous. The, um, 
the experience that made me shiver was a lady called up. She was mad and on the phone yelling, you know, you, whatever you're doing there, my windows are shaking, you know. So I said, where do you live? She didn't want to tell me at first. I said, well, I can't help you, but I don't know where you live. And she finally told me. I went down Wiley Hill Road Power Line Corridor, uh, took a walk up there about 60 yards. I turned my head, looked to my right, and I could see her house uh, about uh, 110, 120 yards away. <coughs> Uh, through the trees from the power line corridor and on the ground in front of me were eight 300 wind mag cartridges. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, but 300 wind mag, a huge, we're talking, so if, if it was a wind mag round leaving our range, that would be an entirely different conversation. That's the. Yeah, if they, I mean, yeah exactly. If 338 Lapua, 7 millimeter rem mag, something that actually could travel that distance, I wouldn't be sitting here banging on the desk saying, and this didn't come from us the math doesn't work but that's what we're faced with of course we understand why they're upset we don't understand why they attacked us in the media the way that they did before the investigation even occurred i could tell you that as far as the you know as far as the um analysis done by sergeant o'donohue that would never be admissible in court i've never seen a ballistics analysis that doesn't even take into account the speed in which a bullet travels and i've seen a lot of those reports including seeing those reports from the gun control lobby. And I could still say when they're valid or not. I mean, I can tell you that we've done our homework here. We're not just disregarding some known or potential liability. It wasn't us, plain and simple. And, you know, ultimately, the board is restricted in, in what you can do under 159.26, but if ultimately the attorney general's office takes the issue up, I'm very confident that they'll find exactly what I've found. The, um, we're not here because we don't care. I have four children and I have 10 grandchildren. We're here because we care. This concerns us that people's houses are being hit with bullets. But at the same time, we also recognize the utility. If say like we, you know, so we, we, we spend 150,000, maybe we make our berm ridiculously high, you know, something to laugh about because it's so high. And then another bullet whack ends up in Mark's pool or uh, Janine's house or where do we go from that point when that happens? You know, um, so yeah, we could spend the money. They might feel better for a short time and we, you know, we're out a hundred K or whatever, but when the next bullet strikes a house, we're, we're n no further ahead than we are. So, I'm probably going to get killed for saying this, but you know when they had when they had that whole fight up at the state house about the preemption, you know, taking you know allowing, uh, it, and a, a small part of me said, "Good, I hope that passes," because that musquash conservation land causes me more trouble than it's worth between the shooters, between the ATVers. I, I don't know which causes me more trouble in terms of cl of that club. You know, but um, that's our reality. We there there are bullets flying all over the place at, uh, over over different times. Uh, when we had that special town meeting in Londonderry over at the Londonderry Country Club, uh, it was to listen to gunfire. That's I think that's the way John Farrell put it. So I'm standing next to the police chief and Mike Ramsdell, the town town council. So the Londonderry Police Range, which is over on the uh, easternmost portion of Rick Charbonneau's gravel pit. Bang, 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 bang. We hear the gunfire. It's not very loud. So then I call my guys. Okay, let it rip. Bang, bang, bang. Gunfire over at Lunder. You couldn't barely hear it. So Mike Ramstell goes through a reading of the statute and, and you know what the legislature has done. And as he's concluding, all of a sudden we hear this god awful ruckus, this gunfire. Bang, 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 bang. The chief looks at me and says, not coming from our range. I said, well, it's not coming from ours. So at that time, there was a group of people that showed up on Fauscher Road and just started cutting loose. And boy, was it loud, you know. But at that time, everybody was pointing a finger at us going, you guys, you're bullets, you know, you're loud. And it, it, it turns out it wasn't us after all. That was a very popular shooting venue. So, I mean, we're not... This is probably going to seem to some folks that we're just trying to push things off. We're not trying to do that at all. 
you know, if there's bullets leaving our range, we, we have to do our due diligence, be responsible for that. But let's make sure that that is the case before, you know, you make us spend the money because we could, sure, we can spend the money, we can do that stuff, but another bullet hits the house, we're right back where we started. And that's really where, where, where we sit. Rick, you've, you've mentioned a musquash. Mm -hmm. How about Litchfield State Forest? Have you had any? I don't have any personal experience with that, but um, I know a lot of folks in Litch, I've heard a lot of conversations in the town here uh, that, that, that that's uh, been used as a shooting venue. The power line corridor for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The power line, cause it's nice and open. I mean, you find makeshift target stands that are just scary where people don't understand you have to look beyond the target. Steve it's there found a pig, uh, an iron pig. In other words, no, I'm not kidding. It's, it's AR 500 steel cut in the shape of a pig. It weighs about 50 pounds. <laughs> Somebody left that out in the musquash. I mean, that costs a lot of money to get those. You still have to carry it back. Yeah. But, uh, but even, I mean, Sergeant O'Donohue specifically said in his report, I quote, it should also be noted that people often shoot in other areas outside the club that could also impact the area of concern on Tanager. You know, I mean, it's, it's a well-known thing. I live in Deerfield. We don't even have a club that's nearby, but I live near Bear Brook State Park. And there are Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays where it sounds like the Tet Offensive out there. You know, it's just people, we're in Southern New Hampshire. It's people don't have areas to shoot and they can't get into a club. We're not accepting members, right? A lot of clubs, the majority of clubs are not. So people just figure out some place to shoot no matter how unsafe it is, unfortunately. And then it leaves us, you know, to ultimately take the baseball to the head. Uh, it's so yeah I just want to reiterate we're here because we wanted to address this stuff and we wanted to just underscore the fact that you know if somebody calls us up at our house or, uh, somebody calls me up at my home and says yeah I, I live in the neighborhood and I had a bullet land in my yard I'm like uh, well that's terrible can can I come to your house and look at it I, I want to see the bullet I want to see where they found it and now I'm looking at trajectories. I have a scale and I have a caliper. I can figure out what the caliber and the weight of that bullet is uh, just by measuring it out. And by its general condition, I can anecdotally guess how long it's been there or how long it's not been there. Um, I, would, I would, well, just one other thing. This idea that there's no training that happens, that's not true. If you're a member, you went through it. If you were you a member at the time, oh, I think he went through an Ed thing. So oh. yeah, I went through an Ed one. Well, so uh, I mean, but what I could say is, is that there's specific training orientation that occurs when people join the club. There's also specific, you know, training and information provided regarding the 200, 400 yard ranges. There are insurance requirements that trainings, you know, take place. Rules are posted. We self police. I could tell you, I've spent a lot of time on the 200, 400. And that's not, a, I mean, you find people that are snobbish, but you don't find people that are ding -a Those are the legal terms I would use. <laughs> it's all shooting on the supervised. It's, it's not supervised per se. There are officers or directors present on a daily basis. And um, we move about the ranges and, you know, see what's going on and, um, observe what's taking place um, we often catch people so our range violations primarily consists of handling firearms while the range is cold okay so that was one of the things that was brought up range violations the specific range violations is you know so now we're at a point where if you're handling a firearm while somebody's forward of the firing line um, you're gonna surrender your membership because yeah. we're tired of it you know, because same thing always happens. You know, the line goes cold and uh, everybody moves down to staple targets, check targets. And there's this one guy, he's done shooting. He's packing up to leave. And I go, hey, you're not supposed to be handling that firearm. And he goes, oh, well, I'm leaving. And I says, you're right. You are leaving, mm -hmm. you know. So and you're not coming back for a month. How's that? So, um, I mean, it's 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 an ongoing situation. When the line is cold, we operate hot ranges does anybody know what that means? In other words, the only time firearms are handled, loaded, unloaded is when the range has been declared hot. Okay, muzzles pointed downrange in a safe direction. 
Uh, when the ranges are cold, firearms are not handled. They're either holstered or slung, period. And we don't make any distinctions or exceptions from that rule. So that's the gist of our range violations, you know, or shooting beer cans on the range. That's a big no-no. You know, there's certain things you can use as targets and there's certain things you can't use. And we call all of those range violations. But in terms of shooting up over the berms, I, you know, I think, Steve, you said there's no, there's no projectiles logged, logged in any of the trees off the 200. There's no bullet strikes. No, no bullet strikes None. There yeah, would that, be. That's a range strikes. that maybe has what on a busy Saturday, maybe five people shoot at it. Yeah. You know, this is not a range where you're going to have fun if you're not someone who's taking precision shooting very seriously. Um, but totally it's separate and apart from that. I mean, it's not like going to Manchester firing line or some public range that someone can just pay to join. I mean, you don't have that experience. If you've shot there, you know, People aren't acting like jerks at London Dairy Fish and Game. You can, I mean, you swing a dead cat and you hit four RSOs. You know, I'm an RSO. Rick's a chief RSO. I mean, Bob, who's on the board, he's a firearms instructor endorsed by the Massachusetts State Police. You won't find a more qualified group of people to be operating a ranch. You know, and I've, I've dealt with public range issues before, and trust me, I've never come and testified like this on behalf of a public range. Um, but I will tell you that, I mean, this is a circumstance where <clears throat> this club cares about its neighbors, cares about operating safely. There isn't a single projectile on Tanager or nearby that's been linked to the club, even, even at 50%. We're, I've never said we well, can't prove it. It's always been this data does not make any sense. It didn't come from us. So that's the position that, that we're kind of in. We wanted you guys to understand that we're not just jerks saying, ah, we don't care about your families. I understand you live on Tanager. We care about you. Uh, we're, not, we're not just saying we don't care that you live on you know, 1.3 miles away. We're just saying it wasn't us. We wish you enlisted, or they enlisted our help instead of accusing us. So, We've had pretty good success. When people call us and want to deal with us rationally one-on-one, -on -one, we, we've had good success for those folks. They understand us better. We understand them better. Yeah. Whether it's noise or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, know, you get one or two that are a little crazy, but that, that's anywhere you go. Yeah. And so there are no further Any questions. Or from the club or public? Well, uh, the, the neighbor. <laughs> well, there's, there's one neighbor. She's a little crazy. So she's fun to talk to on the phone, though. There's always one. I appreciate what you guys have done. You come in and talk the science. I said it from the beginning that that area has there's a lot of shooters in in the woods. I grew up here. Yeah. I used to shoot out there in the woods. I own a chunk of land out there in a Heron Drive. My family does, and I used to go out there and shoot all the time. Oh, did you hit Mark Boudier's pool? No, no. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. This I, I, is I, before Heron Drive. He's not, oh. he's not that good a shot. <laughs> but I even shot 22s, okay? Small yeah. scale. Yeah. Carrying those things today, I don't dare carry them into the woods. <laughs> but I, I, I feel for the people. I also know it's happened to me where I live on Route 3A. Okay? I got duck hunters or geese hunters or what do you want to call them? I had a pool behind the house. Even the windows it got were shot. Then we would down and talk to them. They kindly in the land owner agreed with that. They have to go this way. I didn't kick them out. I wasn't doing that. Be, stop being stupid about it. Okay? And it works. That's what it's all about. Yep. Kevin wants his pig back, by the way. <laughs> 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 that yep. contract that goes up to the power lines through the state forest back there, used to be a house out there. The foundation is still there. Yep. My grandparents who were here knew the person who lived out there. They used to travel that through the state lot road to get back and forth. Okay. That was a great shooting area for us for years. Who grew up here. There's, um, but like, like th those 200, that 200 and 400 yard range, we spent $56,000 on engineering costs and permit fees and 
Um, I mean, before we put shovel one in the dirt, you know, and uh, we had to deal with Tr John Trottier. Enough said. Okay. okay. We even protect the turtles over there, right? We even protect the turtles. Got the little turtle rocks in our swale. Yes, yeah, so that they can, <laughs> they can cross. Yep. <laughs> Someday I like to go up there and just look at the site again. Absolutely. I, 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 I was the building inspector here for a few years. I remember. Okay. I said sorry. no to my stupid street signs. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had no choice. You know, don't. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> just something occurred just recently. Don't put that. Uh, I think um, I like to see the plan. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a type of guy that has to see it too. Sure. As you know, as a building inspector, as well, we do. I want to see the as built. I have that. That too. It's got the berm cuts and everything. That everything I think exceeds NRA have, standards. I just look at the whole thing because <coughs> I, I believe in science, as you guys have. I have a problem with and what you're telling me so far. They may have found some extra shells, but they can be from anywhere, okay? I mean, extra bullets. We got two that were somewhere else. And I do know all the time that I've been in the construction, it wasn't always the fishing game that was shooting in the woods. I used to go out to the projects out there and pe hear people shoot close by. I'm just saying what I know and hear it. That's the other thing we have a hard time with. <coughs> if somebody calls us and they're going to talk to us on the phone, we need to know date, you know, date, what time. Did, where, where, did you actually hear, you know, because, I mean, so, sometimes our ranges, we get calls and our ranges aren't even active. Um, you know, Londonderry Police have a range. They operate after dark. We don't operate after dark. So and we still get the calls. I don't hear your ranges from where I live on down Route 3A down here in the farm. But uh, I know I hear the, the, the Londonderry one, the like Ricks, because they're up high in that, in that concrete area. Mm -hmm. I know the Lystro has a little range yep. here. Okay. And there's other. Hudson yeah. has one. Yep. 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 They, they all have them. Okay. Uh, Personal question, because I live in, in the, the neighborhood. Why is my observation yep. that the, the activity at the club over COVID and still now has decreased by well over 50%. Yeah. Is that a true statement or it's yeah. true? Yeah, yeah. Ammo, yeah. ammo costs. It's, it's, so that's the rumor I heard. Price of ammo. You can't yeah. get ammo so for recreational use. One of the other things, too, is like uh, John Latcha, he had a Litchfield Community Television show. I was on with him about four or five years ago talking, talked for an hour about the club and how we always have an ongoing plan. We're always doing improvements <coughs> where we can and when we can. And uh, so over the years, we've increased the side berm <coughs> height. So that's throttling back a lot of sound, wow. you know. Um, uh, that, that's one factor. Again, ammo is another factor. But a lot of people are buying handguns mm -hmm. because we live in scary times. So they... You know, maybe they've never owned a gun. All now, all of a sudden, they're coming out and they're taking a class from Bob, or yeah. taking a class from me. Uh, you know, defensive handgun class or, or what have you, coming out to the club. So, uh, so handgun you doesn't. Hear, you wouldn't hear the handgun fire. No, you, you wouldn't. Can, but you're not there as, on your car not as shooting, much. but you wouldn't. Yeah. Really hear yeah. No, you're not really going to hear it. But from right, right before the pandemic hit, ammo had hit 40-year lows. You know, I can I can tell you from just representing a, several different dealers that the ammo costs, there was a huge glut because after people, there's a huge surge in people buying firearms in 2013 and 14 after Sandy Hook, the ammo companies tried to ramp up production to keep up with demand. And then suddenly the man fell out, so they were left with a glut. So like, for example, you could get you know, brass nine millimeter uh, full metal jacket ammunition for 14 cents a round. Now, cheapest you can find, it's 45 cents. So that's, I mean, people have to budget accordingly. Yeah. Plus, you can't afford to drive there, you know, <laughs> gas prices. That's true. So. May I ask one question, just inquire only? Sure. You mentioned Musquash and Sharon Carson. Yeah. What is the current, is there a zoning that they can't be out there doing that? I'm assuming. So I will tell you <laughs> what this. What is the status of that? I will tell you this as far, there is an ordinance that was passed in 2015 <clears throat> that specifically limits caliber um, and when shooting can occur in the musquash. I will also tell you that that ordinance is facially invalid under RSA 15926 mm -hmm. um, because the, it specifically does not allow uh, the use, so government subdivisions to regulate the use of firearms 
That being said, uh, they're well aware of that in Londonderry, which is part of the reason they were trying to get a change to the preemption law. Um, but I don't know that anyone's ever even challenged their ability in court to have passed that ordinance. People just haven't followed it, and it's a huge area to try to police it. Oh, yeah, it's massive. It's, it sounds like, you know, the science is proving it's probably not you. So, But where do our residents go? What, what would the... I, I, is that Londonderry or Litchfield? I'm looking at the map over there. Litchfield State Forest or Muskwat. Where would that be, uh, Kevin? Uh, I, I just don't know where to point them. If it, I'll help you point. Well, not point to the map, but the, the residents. Here. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're, we would be up a little higher in Londonderry. Londonderry's there, there, yeah. This here area? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, go up this street right here, then go up and then up in here. I mean, other, other than arresting people that, you know, if, if there's a home or a business that's hit and they're able to respond quickly. And that happens. Every, yeah, every single time that someone's arrested for that, it's felony reckless conduct. Um, that's, I mean, that's what happened when that bullet entered that cafeteria. But that's, I don't know of any other way to police it. I think in part it's just people don't know. They don't know that they're not supposed to be doing that or they don't know how to actually set up a safe shooting area. Um, yeah, if you, if you go out there, you can see uh, like all over the ground. I mean, it looks like in certain places, it looks like World War III happened. So the residents here that feel in danger should contact Londonderry and town well, I mean, and, call, and, you can and do see if they can get police, to a meeting yeah. over there. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an enforcement nightmare. That's, that's, the, that's the issue. Um, I mean, certainly we, I mean, we can't arrest people. We're just citizens. But, you know, if, if we're in a place where we can get, we can get to people and interact with them, you know, uh, and, and we have done that. We've had, we've had people out by the switchyard shooting. And, you know, it's, you can't shoot here. Oh, yeah, well, what gives you authority? Well, you know, punch in the face. What gives you <laughs> me the authority to get you out of here? You know. <laughs> but I mean, it's unfortunate you have those conversations with people like that, you know. But like, the big thing out in the out in the Musquash is is ATVs, and and there's no trespassing signs all over the place, and peop yet people are still out there. Right, we have an easement. That's why we cross the power line corridor. You know, and and. Um, we have certain responsibilities and duties to uh, New England Power as a result of having that access point. And, uh, you know, one of the things is we're going to be jealously guarding what people do in that or what they don't do. You know, we're not going to let people shoot. You know, and we'll let the judge decide whether we can legally enforce it or not. But they're not shooting in that little area, says us. Anything else? I want to thank you for coming in. Yeah, Thanks. thank you for taking the time coming in and bringing all this information. It helps. Well, thank you for having thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You're right with your science now. You can do them. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank thanks. you, gentlemen. Thank you. Have a great thank night. You. Have a good one. Thank you. You all stay safe, guys. Take care. Take care. Being 7.53 p.m., I'd like to open up for public input. Do we have any members of the public that would like to provide input this Come evening? Come on up. Come on up. Hi. Uh, my name is Nicola Beauregard, B-E-A-U-R-E-G-A-R-D. So thank Hi. you for taking this. Welcome. 21 Corning Room. Thank you. Um, and uh, first, I want to apologize if you felt that anything that I posted on Facebook was liable or an error. Um, I spoke directly to Kevin, the road agent, um, right after the, the poll was taken down. And he told me that it was taken down because the selectman received complaints. He did not say it was because it was a distraction. He said it was because people didn't like it. He had also told me that he had seen it prior to that and he didn't have a problem with it. He also told me that he has seen the decor on that poll for many years and has never had a problem with it. I have asked police over the years, is this okay? And they have told me, it's fine. I have had de decor on that poll that was way more distracting than the, one, the poll that I put up on Monday. 
I had a Patriots jersey that came out away from the pole. I remember that. <laughs> I have had lights on that pole, solar lights. And one of the reasons I started decorating it was the same reason my neighbor down the street started decorating his. Corning Road has no street lights. It's extremely dark. And it's not straight. It curves a little bit. So people speed terribly up and down Corning Road. I've had no less than three pets killed on that road. Uh, my neighbors have had pets killed on that road. Thank God no child has ever been killed on that road. Not out of the question. Speeders don't get stopped on that road. And myself, I've lived on that corner for over 22 years. I don't see anybody getting stopped for speeding. I don't see anything being done about speeding, which I think is a danger. Yeah. I put up a pole with rainbow colored tape mm -hmm. and it was taken down three days later. Mm -hmm. I have Christmas decorations up there that no Jewish person or Muslim or anybody else who doesn't like Christmas complained about. I've had the American flag up there multiple times I have that pole in my backyard <laughs> because we've taken it from the street side and we put it on a side, on an old um, post from an, an old fence. And actually, I was going to use that one to put the rainbow tape on because I didn't have another pole because my husband threw away my other one and he wouldn't let me use the <coughs> American flag one. So I find it hard to believe that the pole was taken down because it was a distraction. As a matter of fact, it brings attention to that pole. We had a car hit the telephone pole there a few years ago in the middle of winter because the kid said, that, that telephone pole came out of nowhere. Because if you're driving down Corning Road, if you notice, it curves a little bit right there. If you go straight, you hit the telephone pole. If he had been two inches further, he would have hit my daughter's car. And if she had been in it, she would have been dead because you can't see the corner. I put a rainbow taped plastic pole around the pole, not attached to the pole, not covering Arcadian Lane, not distracting anything. So I find it hard to believe that the person was distracted that said that it was obscured. The road agent even told me that it was not obscured. So my question to you is, am I not allowed to put any decorations on that pole ever again? And is nobody else? Because I didn't start it. I got it from an idea from someone else who had already been doing it years before me. So that's the question. The, the support under the Facebook post indicated many people enjoy it and um, as I've been out there decorating my lawn with more decorations than I ever thought that I was gonna buy for Pride Month, but now I'm buying a whole bunch. Um, I've had many neighbors stop and give me my support and have told my neighbor across the street, um, Barb Surrett, who Jerry and Barb have lived there longer than me. And <laughs> Jerry, has been vociferous against the Biden signs that I had on my lawn and we had a nice conversation about that and he told me he couldn't wait until they were down but he didn't come over and take them down. But Barb came over and said the same thing to me. She said, I don't agree with gay people or whatever that symbolizes but it's a shame that someone made you take that pole down. So none of the dissenters on that Facebook post said anything about this, it being distracting to drivers. So that's my statement and my, I'd like your response, I guess. I mean, I can only speak to what I know. I had two residents call me and they said that they were concerned and I never knew this pole was decorated. I didn't know what it was decorated. I never get to the north end of the town. I live in the south end of the town. The closest I would get would be the ball field over in Brook Road. So I've never been there. They said that they were concerned that there was a um, safety issue and a distraction. So I said, okay, we'll have it looked into it. I sent a text to town administrator Brown and also to the road agent. Mm -hmm. And I just basically said I had two residents that called in that said it was a distraction, that they were concerned about safety and visibility. Could you please go out and look at it? And if you do deem it that way, please remove it. 
Mm-hmm. The road agent who was responsible for the signs, mm-hmm. he went out there. He deemed it to be nobody. Nobody forced him to do it. He he looked at it and said, "I feel that it's a distraction. It's also a violation to decorate a street sign." And he removed it. He brought it back to the town. You called him, and he returned it to you. And from what I understand, he had a discussion with you. Mm-hmm. At no point did anybody in that conversation ever say it was offensive. I don't find it offensive at all. Um, I don't think anybody sitting on this board finds it offensive whatsoever. You know, and then what, what kind of is offensive is the attack this board took from speculation that was out there. You know, it, it, nobody called us to even have a discussion with us about what transpired. Why did it happen? You know, instead, everybody just kind of got on to the whole entire role and was crucifying the board of selectmen, the town administrator, and the road agent. And we have nothing no issue whatsoever with the symbolism um it's just when we get a complaint we have to look at what is the statute we have to go and look at Mm -hmm. it's very i can't believe that we got a complaint over at this time i can't speak to why the person complained but all they said was that was the issue so at that point the road agent went off and did his job Mm -hmm. you know Uh, so i spoke directly to kevin Mm -hmm. so i apologize for the attack that you received. It was the attack wasn't from you. It was from other people. No, who I know, up. but the, the he no he did not tell me that it was a distraction. He did not tell me that that was the complaint. He told me people didn't like it. He told me that yes, he had to take it down because according to the law, you can't attach something to a sign. However, he also said he's seen them for years. He had no problem with them, but because somebody complained, he had to take it down. But he didn't say it was because of a distraction. Okay, that's what he reported to me when I spoke. And he also told me that he didn't. Now, I don't want to bring him into it because it doesn't matter. He was very apologetic. Mm -hmm. He was very nice. Mm -hmm. But I sent a letter to you also. There are pictures. Can you please look at the pictures and tell me that that is a distraction? Can you tell me that that obstructs the sign or distracts that corner in any way? And can you, you tell me that the opinion of these two people outweighs that because my counter is I've lived on that corner for 22 years, cars hit it, people spin around that corner, snow plows hit it, and that coloring on that brings the signpost into view so people can see that there's a stop sign and they need to stop. At least one of my cats was killed right in that intersection because people go through that stop sign and people rush up and down that road and there's no lights. So these two people think it's a distraction. There were 200 people on Facebook that drive by it daily that said it's not a distraction. So I understand it's a law. So now because these two people found it a distraction that this rainbow colored pole around the post that did not obstruct one thing, no one else is ever going to have that joy again. I can't do it anymore. No one else is gonna do it anymore. I can't decorate it for Patriots. I can't decorate it for Christmas. I can't decorate it as a menorah for Amy Goldberg, who said that she loved the Christmas decorations even though she's Jewish. So when the snowplow knocks it down and it costs you guys that much money to put up a new sign, I hope that those two residents are happy that they weren't distracted by that because I don't buy it. I don't buy it at all. That is not why they wanted it down, and I don't believe it. And you can tell me that all day long. So. I think the board has to talk about this in another manner. I was not distracted by that sign. I saw it, and I didn't see it personally. I didn't even know it until after it was done. Okay, at the selectmen, I wasn't told that this was going to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think you know, Steve took it, went to there, there, or Troy. Mm-hmm. But if it's if it's one on one, I've been dealing with government for years. And if you got a complaint, there's always been if somebody's got a complaint about something, give me his name and write it down, okay? Mm-hmm. Then we'll look into it and get back to him whether it's justifiable or not. Mm-hmm. That's my feeling on this. 
they took a different approach, fine. That's possible. Okay, it didn't arrive the right away, but I know on that street there's been three or four out there towards Route 3A, Patriots sign. I'm not a sports guy. I think that's distracting. Okay? <laughs> right, so some Jets person okay, might have not liked that Patriots <coughs> sign. <up> candy, <laughs> candy striper. Okay, it's for Christmas, Christmas tree. I'd be able to see the sign that I was not looking for for the street. Yeah. I was, I was just thinking the other day, and I talked to my wife about it. I said, why don't we paint different signposts different colors? Okay. There's nothing, no law against that, per se. A lot uh, of cities put different things on the tops of their signposts. Yeah, I've seen the football one year up down there. It was bigger than the sign. I know. It's, it's a matter of opinion. That's all it is. And they took the approach. Kevin did what he did based off the law. But each town enforces stuff differently, even though the law is there. Okay, and how that is affected, we got to look into that. That's my opinion on it. Okay, I'm not blaming Steve. He's got well, Kevin, I mean, I do the same exact thing that you do if someone came and said a tree was down, right? Yeah. You'd call up Troy, you'd call up Kevin, go take care of the tree. It's if the tree is in the road, that, that's a blockage. But what I'm trying to say is something gets reported to a slug, then what we do every single time is we go to Troy, we go to the department right. head. They're the people we put in power to go out and take care of this. Correct. Right? Yep. And that's and the that's just policy said. we've always followed. This board, said. every board before us, has always followed this policy. Now, I think it's very unfortunate that we had to take the action that we took. But we had to take the action that we did. I mean, mm -hmm. same thing with with everything else that we do. And it's it's not... I think Sometimes there's things I, in I our think, job we have to do well, that we really dislike that you have I to do. I think the manner that it happened is over. The fact of the, the way the way it happened is over, over, and all of the facts are out before you. So it's up to you, I suppose. It's up to you as a group to decide if you want people in Litchfield decorating signs. Because now I feel like it's going to be a big deal, and now you're like, oh, well, you could do this, but you can't do that. And if you're going to do it that way, now you're going to do it this way. We could allow this, we could allow that, and now it's going to be a big freaking deal. Mm -hmm. it, which is which is which is terrible. I mean, yes, it's, it is. It really is. But Especially oh, in Litchfield. I know. Yeah, it's exactly, obvious. because it, it completely sends the wrong message, right. especially where, I mean, it's been almost 10 years that I've been decorating that pole. I mean, it's not like I just started a couple months ago. The, uh, and I, 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 have, I, I can't remember seeing your pole, but I can remember the other at least the one on Corning Road. Yep. Jay and, and uh, well, that's where I learned it from. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we started and, and doing I, them at the same time. I thought it was so neat that he had, you know, like I brought a smile to my face exactly. every time I saw that. And uh, but uh, it, it's a shame that we have to go through with this. But you can understand. I understand. But the, um, the motivation for the people that, that complained about it is um, not altruistic. Well, if it, that it, is truly what they reported, that is not the reason that they wanted that poll down. And it's unfortunate that through the loophole of the law that their request was granted so quickly without further investigation into the subject. But there's nothing we can do about what happened be behind us. I think that obviously, um, you know, there's no blame on the board, but it's a question of what message are we gonna send the rest of the town? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate because <laughs> it's hard to make friends as an adult in this town. My kids went to school from first to 12th grade, all three of them. And you know all the people because of their kids and the sports. And you're at the field together, and you're at the this together, and you're at the that together. But when your kids go to college, you don't know anybody in Litchfield anymore. But decorating a pole on my corner brings together people in my neighborhood and lets me know people that I don't know. But here's another thing that we can't do anymore because somebody didn't like the rainbow colors on my pole. You, oh, 
In come a moment. On, come on up. Come on up. Come on up if you want to come. Yeah. Name and address. <coughs> well, so I, I'd just say I, I think it stinks. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, because, I mean, if you didn't tell me that that was decorated as a pride bowl, I never would have known. I'm not that hip when it comes to this. Um, I've seen the poles decorated many times. Um, I've never had an issue with it. I think it's unfortunate how this happened. And I think maybe we need to look at our statutes in town and decide what we can and can't do. You got it. And maybe make some alterations. And, you, and then the big issue for us would be if something is, in fact, offensive, that we take care of it. Okay, but I personally, I mean, I don't have a problem with this. I have no problem at all. Uh, it's unfortunate that some people aren't very tolerant and still chose to make an Trump issue out of it. So this, this was a federal law? Or I think if you, had, if you had local ordinance, I think if you, I think I think if you had local. I think there's a New Hampshire RSA that states that you cannot modify or alter any traffic sign, signal, or device is where it comes down. The sign wasn't touched. But does a local ordinance, I think a local ordinance might be able to, it's I think they'd be that's what we down. need to get So we could look at a local yep. ordinance and a Let's work on this, this issue. The, the, the difficulty we're we going to have is how do you define what is. You're, well, you're, you're going to circle right back to the, the same conversation you had oh, about yeah. the use of the town seal. Town center, yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think in, you know, in, in hindsight about this, I think from from a public employee's point of view um i think i think the town failed for the past many years that the decoration and different themes have occurred on town street signs and it should have been stopped years ago and unfortunately uh, this latest decoration was the one that was removed but it should never have been allowed. Just my personal opinion, because it's a town street sign, town stop signs. We can't have residents just going out and decorating them however they feel. I know it's nice. I know all the positive things you're saying, but if there's a safety concern about people going off the road, hitting uh, utility poles, and you need a street light, then the selectmen should be putting a street light in. You shouldn't be decorating poles. If there's a, ste a speed problem, you continually contact the police department we get special speed control up there okay I want that's to be on how the you deal for it. both of those things <laughs> i need speed control but, and street lights but i do feel that i feel in general we all failed you that this was going on for these many years and it should have been stopped um just for the liability because when one person does this and another one does this and one doesn't like this and this is why government normally does not allow you know, this type of stuff to occur because once you allow one, you gotta allow all. And you you can't start regulating, you know, the speech, the religion, the belief. I don't think the board of the town wants to be in that position. And I do just wanna state my involvement in all of this because I really didn't know that much about it. I saw a text message go out. I wasn't at work Friday. I saw the text message go out. I saw the road agent said, Brown said he'll go look at it. Then I saw a text message come back saying they removed it. And um, I went on with my weekend. Sunday night, I saw a social media. I'm like, wow, this really gained some traction. And saw the town administrator name in there and everything. So if anyone's watching tonight, just let you know, there was no directive given by myself, by Chairman Weber. The road agent, I feel, did his job. When someone brings something to our attention, he, he removed it. Our, our fault is we probably should have removed the old field goal, the Christmas decorations. <laughs> we should have acted on this years ago, and it was unfortunate that your decoration was, was the first one that was addressed. Thank you. I still well, that's like not it. what you wanted to hear. <laughs> well, no, but, but it's that's fair. That's my opinion. No, but it's fair, and, and that's why I've asked the police over the years. I've asked the police, is this okay? And they're always like, yeah, we love it. it yeah, we love it. Yeah, it's Betty had something to uh, say. I just wanted to say, you know. Come on up, Betty. Because you got to give us your name and address. you gotta, <laughs> you got to do this right. We you have know. a man behind the curtains typing up minutes right now. <laughs> Besides, Not that have, one there, another one. We haven't seen you in ages. I know. How you been? <laughs> I'm doing great. <laughs> I have a lot less stress since I try to 
<laughs> in, interact with you. Anyway. Um, Name? Elizabeth Vaughn. <laughs> Hi, Jean Stark Lane, Richmond, New Hampshire. There you go. And, um, yeah, I just want to say <coughs> that maybe you could make a statement about the fact that um, it was just an error and you support the people in Litchfield who are LGBTQ and because there are people in Litchfield who, you know, are gay and lesbian families and so forth. So, you know, it's good to support people mm -hmm. in town and let them know that they're all, everybody's welcome. And so that's all I have to really say is just like if there was any way you can make a statement about well, that. Well, I know for one that I support every resident, no matter what walk of life you come from, it's, you know, your resident's with us. And I think everybody here feels the same exact way. You know, and nobody, uh, I, I can speak for myself, I don't find any of it offensive I whatsoever. Two votes right there. So next year we'll get some pride flags out on 3A for the month of June. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. I'm sorry we had to take the action. As, we, as we went through this, you know, I think, uh, first of all, um, Kevin Brown, I, I think, did, a, did, did his he was, duty. He was wonderful. He was very polite. We had a very nice conversation. Uh, uh, I was trying, in my own mind, trying to say, well, how could we preserve the tradition of decorating whatever size, because I don't find any of it distracting myself. Uh, you know, uh, Chrissy and Jay's thing up, you know, is right on your street, and it brought a joy to me when I smiled in my face. And then I said, well, maybe we could have people come in and apply to the selectmen what they're going to do and how long they're going to keep it up and, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Because that would preserve it, but it would lend some control to it. And then I thought about it a while. And I said, you know, can we, could we possibly do that and that open ourselves up to grief? And I, I think it. we would be. Mm -hmm. And I, I think mm -hmm. of, um, and this is a case, and, and just bear with me here for a second. But in the 70s, there was a <laughs> group in Skokie, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, if you're not familiar with it. But the American Nazi Party had petition to have a parade in Skokie, Illinois. The reason they chose Skokie was because it's predominantly Jewish. Mm -hmm. And not only was it predominantly Jewish, but there was an overwhelming majority were Holocaust survivors. And sad. these guys, maybe 20 or 30 of them, petitioned to have a, a march down the main street of Skokie, Illinois, with all the regalia, with swastikas and so forth. And this <coughs> went up through the courts. And the uh, irony of it is the ACLU, which is predominantly Jewish, mm -hmm. defended the American Nazi Party. Right. And the end result was the Supreme Court said, that this was a valid freedom of speech and approved march. And I, I thought of that when I was thinking, it was, is there any possible way that we could do this, preserve it, but not open ourselves up to a can of worms? Well, you have case history. And I thought of and, and we have many Jewish, as we have many uh, uh, gay families in town, right. we have many Jewish families. Right. And what if somebody, out of hate, decorated a street sign with swastikas right. in front of a Jewish? That would, that would totally be terrible. Right. So 
it's it's a shame in our society that you know I I feel that we put too much emphasis on sexuality too much emphasis on sexuality in our culture I mean when you have a Super Bowl halftime show and there's all kinds of twerking and jerking and all sorts of stuff. That's why you turn to the Puppy Bowl. <laughs> yes. Um, Just learned about the Puppy Bowl this year. But, <laughs> and we're talking about uh, sexuality to our kindergartners and our first graders and our second graders. When I was that age, I didn't know there was any difference between right. boys and girls, you know? But that being well, that's that's my own the library. So well, that's a whole other library. conversation. That yeah. I'm sure we don't I, I have agree, time and that's tonight. And that's all my own personal history. Yeah. But everybody brings that, you know. Right. Well, but, it's not about sexuality. It's about mm -hmm. acceptance and love. It's there's nothing sexual about any of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think people have a hard time getting over is that we're not talking about what people do in the bedroom or what sexuality is. We're just talking about letting people be who they are. And that's all that that's all there is about it. And it's unfortunate that there's people in this town that feel that uh, that they don't want everybody to be who they want. They want everybody to be who they are. And so um, that's what's getting pushed lately. And so if you want to talk about that, I'll see you at the library trustees meeting in a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> I, I think I'll pass on that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, th I thank you for your time. I completely understand. It, it's a shame because, as I said, we know that it's one pole in the whole <laughs> town of Litchfield that's been decorated lately for oh, the last recently, seven or eight years. The phone company, or I should, PSNA, should de decorating their poles, the yellow, big, oh. you know, thick figures. But I can tell you that Corning Road is dangerous. People go very fast. It is very dark. It is not a straight road. And my corner is right on a curve. And I've had at least one car hit it, and many almost hit it. So the reason I decorated the pole was so people wouldn't kill themselves. But that's the end of it. So. It's like a mailbox. Thank, I want to okay. personally thank you for coming in because I think we all see social media goes on and it's a wonderful communication tool. Mm -hmm. But when sometimes issues like this come up and people are questioning and accusing selectmen and road agents and town administrators, and I, you know, I don't want to jump into that conversation on social media, but mm -hmm. I think it's great that you came in and, and talked to the board because most people that are out there talking, mm -hmm. it's good to have that conversation. But to come in and talk face to face, I want to compliment you for well, doing that. Well, thank That's you. Just, it's just amazing what you've done is that you've oh. come in here oh, and you. talk to us. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, my father was a BS artist, and I <laughs> and I got that from him. It's the Irish in me. Yeah, that's nice. But <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Well, I yeah. think that um, <laughs> got a full row here. You know, my kids are grown up, like I said, but um, people need to pay attention to what's going on in the town and. People need to know that there's more people than just the parents of the children in the town. That we have a large population of people who don't have children. And the Veterans Park is awesome because like, there's nowhere for people to go mm -hmm. to get together. Um, you know, but you know, we're getting it all sides. We're getting it in the library. And then Debbie Rice, who's been exercising in the park for nine years, the Recreation Committee is giving her crap. It's like, why? Why are we trying to break down places and things that bring community together instead of building them up? So it's time. You're going to be seeing more of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank Appreciate you so much it. for taking your Thank time. You. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Have a good evening. You too. <laughs> Since we have no other citizens in here. We do have one letter that was sent that I was asked to please read into public input and as our usual we'll read it as in its entirety. <clears throat> the letter is, I'm writing to you as a concerned resident to express my frustration of the Penichuk water rate crisis here in town. In my 25 years as a, t as a resident town, the water rates have always been an issue. Litchfield pays three times more for water than Hudson and five times more than Manchester. 
I think the town needs to seriously start thinking of how to take this burden off the community. In my opinion, maybe the town could use the ARPA funds to do a study or form a subcommittee under the BOS who can make this their sole priority. This committee could look into joining forces with neighboring towns like Hudson, Londonderry, and Manchester, or consider purchasing the water system for Penichuk like Hudson did. I think this is one issue that the town would agree on, and I believe the current board has the knowledge and ability to finally do something about it. Thank you, Karen Salidas, 31 Pearson Street. I don't disagree with it nope. at all. I don't think and I'm on a does. well, so, <laughs> but I feel for the people that pay outrageous water bills. You look at the other towns, the municipalities around, around us, Penachuck East is up. Mm -hmm. Penachuck's even lower, Penachuck is south, yep. okay, which is east. Yep. East as those east from, west, from yep. our side. West is down, east is up. I was very disappointed in that, and I, what happened with the PUC is terrible. And now I hear that they're talking about, you know, huge increases, mm -hmm. uh, not just for water, but for Electric power. Yep. And that impacts everybody. Uh, and, yeah, and I don't know what people are gonna do. People that are on a tight budget, yep. mm -hmm. it's gonna be bad this winter. It really is gonna be bad. And I, I, it's not going to be pretty at all. But I, I don't disagree with the letter writer at all. May I say something? Of course. Was it, was, was it Hudson that paid for their own infrastructure? Didn't they buy their own? They bought their They stuff. bought their own pipes. We're well, paying because we're renting well, their. Well, there was al already a company, Hudson Water Company, was already established. And when I think they were going bankrupt. And was being taken over by Penichuk. Hudson put a bond through and purchased that and hired Penichuk to run it. That's why they, they have a lower rate. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the guy's name, but I know he, he is. So they have a lower rate because of that. Yep. Because they're they not own, they, they own, own it. All. They own the oh, pipes yeah. and all of that. And off the profit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like half. Yep. So yep. for Litchfield to do that would have to pay for infrastructure and I don't know if do we need a water station? I, I don't know. Water station, water station, <laughs> so that's it, it would be a big deal. <laughs> I know. I'm, that's what I'm saying. The ARPA funds. Not gonna be I, I wouldn't cover it. I know, but I want well, to explain it. To no, I think the ARPA yeah. funds would be uh, a report that would kind of give you yeah. um, a very, um, I don't want to say a very a rough estimate, but, it, but it may be an estimate of what the infrastructure would cost you and what the legal procedures would be to take it over. Take it over. You're talking about an imminent domain taking mm -hmm. and I is way above my head but you know this goes back to consumers water when the city of Nashua took consumers which was yep. part of this yep. by imminent domain I think at the same time Hudson stepped up and said well we're gonna carve out our piece yep. Yep. Uh, Litchfield didn't do anything and so now they're under Penichuk East but the parent company, I believe, is the city of Nashua. That's way above my legal. Yep, that's know. correct. Mm -hmm. You got that right. And it, it's going to be, it's something like that is going to be very expensive for the taxpayers. And I personally, I already think we're spending money at an incredible rate in this town. Yes. Um, we've got to give the taxpayers relief. We've got to slow it down. Well, even not, the rental cost. It's not going to stop. I mean, it, it's, no, it's, it's, it's worth, uh, it really is truly worth doing a real investigation because you've got your fi you know we, we've reduced the hydrant fees but they're going to be right back at the half million dollars oh, yeah. in a couple mm -hmm. of years yep. Yep. the next the, the penachuck is going to file for another rate increase in another oh yeah they're going to come back 18 months, again. months yeah. mm -hmm. it's just going to keep on going they're not going to stop nope. <clears throat> they need to maintain the infrastructure and the cost of everything goes up and since Nash owns it and they're pumping the water under the river now and collecting it too to bring it to penachuck they're putting that mm -hmm. pipe in, mm -hmm. and then we got the what the tank now in Rocky Hill. Mm -hmm. Nashua own it, okay. It actually owns us. The Panchuck East is just a name. Yeah. Yep. I had a uh, person come up to me, who it's a double income family. I think the she made sixty thousand. The other party, mm -hmm. um, maybe not as high, but 
that. Mm -hmm. They, she was crying, and she doesn't know how she's going to pay for the fuel. Mm -hmm. It's an oil tank, mm -hmm. and the water bill, and they already go to the food pantry. Yeah. So this is I tough. I think our assistance was a two-income family awful. home. Yes. Hmm? Sorry. I was just saying, Troy, the, I think the, our, um, our assistance is going to be general assistance. Yeah. It's going to be way up this year. Yeah. I, I, I think that's going to be the rule, not the exception. Yep. Yes, it's going to be it's going to be cost of food. Yep. We're going to have food shortages. Uh, it's going back to the roof. But it's fuel, it's heating oil, gasoline. I mean, everything's going up. I did hear good news though um, with the strawberry festival What's going on. Down to Speaking to the people in the food pantry, the donations are up. Yeah. Which is nice to hear. The people mm -hmm. are still donating a, a lot to the food bank. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mrs. Salidas, for your input. Being that it is 8:30, we'll close public input. The next agenda item we have is the resignation acceptance of Chief Freitzel as the Emergency Management Director. Mr. Brown. I've shared um, Chief Freitzel's resignation letter. He is serving. Uh, he is your fire chief, but separately, they're not t the two are not connected. He's, he is appointed by this board as the emergency management director and receives an annual stipend of $1,500 to do that. So he has put you on notice that he no longer wishes to serve, uh, effective the end of June. Um, I reached out to legal counsel to, to actually find out more about the emergency management director's role and uh, what would happen if we didn't have someone in place by the dead, you know, by the time the chief resigns. And the way the law is written, it's, it kind of, even though it doesn't say it specifically, it talks about the chief municipal officer assuming the role. And I said, well, who's the chief municipal officer? And they said, well, it doesn't really say, but we have to assume it's a member of the Board of Selectmen. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't Tom Minster. They said uh, a member of the Board of Selectmen. If you want to If you haven't appointed someone. If so you just you, want to stipend, not, just say so. No. <laughs> so I don't know what you do. You're not, what is this now? We, we don't meet again. We don't meet Tom again Tom Minster resigns. Um, if you think this is a position, at least for now, um, to appoint the town administrator. In the past, before we, may, we put the chief in charge, I understand unofficially uh, the, the responsibility was shared with the fire chief and the town administrator yep. and then it was never made clear and then you know a couple years ago we officially designated the fire chief so, so when in this is going when forward you just you know if you use me now but they, that way you could always <laughs> unappoint me if you figure it out you wanted someone else 30th. June 30th. I'm leaving but you know June 30th it, it, it could be the town administrator is just going to be the emergency management director in this town, but you can have a resident, uh, you know, and it can be a selectman. Um, do you have a job description on that? Uh, is there um, one? I will ask the chief tomorrow. I state I may have one, and there's state laws and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if we have one written here. Possibly we could build it into the uh, to the job description for, for the, the town administrator. The town administrator. But what I was thinking is that that might, if we did that, then we need to go into the interview process with, with that in mind. With it known. Right. right. Um. Well, I mean, it seems to me that the fire department is the logical place to have it. Um, they have what is called the command vehicle, which is for situations. I mean, uh, I mean, if we take, if we don't have it there, I mean, do we take the command vehicle and put it wherever we do have it? Yeah, because you gotta look at it, they have to do the town emergency operation plan, which yep. comes up every three years or five years? Yeah, probably more five. Where, I mean, we're probably 18 months away. So they do that, and then they also have to take care of the hazard mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. So being a hazard mitigation plan, you think it would go to the fire department, someone within the fire department. Yep, I, of I the agree. apparatus they have. I agree, and I mean, we have the, I mean, don't we have the power to make it part of the job description? You do. Yeah, we do. Yes, we do. So, right. 
I mean, I, I'm I'm for keeping it where it is. I, I, I think it's logical. It was, I think it. it went very smooth during COVID. I, yep. And I don't see any Same reason to change it. Well, I guess with the issue when I made is that comment, I thought you were talking about moving it to the town administrator. <laughs> so no, no, no. so I, no. um, when I said we do, yeah. I, I thought you were like we were advertising and we're going to put no. it to the town administrator. But no. um, keep I would, if we were going to go in that direction, um, yeah, I would just want to just touch base with legal counsel and come back to you. Yeah, because so, because I, right now, be it it's it's contract, it's not I part agree. of the contract. It's not part, it's not of, part of his employment contract. Yeah, correct. Either. So we'd have to go back and talk to legal about, you know, but what are the options? Why well, have the days we used to say any other assigned duty is subject to that? Isn't that written in? The, is that part of the contract? Yeah. Any other duties is designed? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look that up. You need to be in there. I think it is. But if you could just have legal go and look at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please. We'll know what our options please are. Please do. So I'm, I'm just a little bit confused. So... He's resigned as that, mm -hmm. but he's still a fire chief. Yes. Correct. So what you're suggesting is to roll that into the fire chief's duty. Yeah. Yep. Roll it into the job description. Go ahead, Ben. But what, what we don't know is legally is we have an employment contract. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, legally, yeah. I'm not, you know, we... I mean, you have to consult with legal counsel. Yeah, because didn't we roll the health officer into the building inspector's contract? We did. Yeah. It always into was the job before. description. Into the job description. It was there before, prior and then it was gone, and yeah, then we rolled it in. Yeah. Yeah. When, the, the when we were doing the interview, we made it clear that we'd mm -hmm. be transitioning. Yeah. Same thing with the zoning. But why we why we investigate this, we probably should make a motion so at least come July 1st, mm -hmm. we do have somebody appointed just in case. If I was going to make a motion, I would make a motion that we stand pat and we don't accept the resignation until we hear from legal. I agree. Yeah, July 7th, is it? It is the 27th. So it's yeah. Why don't we go to the end of yeah. July with his motive? His, if he wants to do it, in the meantime, we can research what we need to find out. Yeah. He, he has submitted his resignation. Mm -hmm. Effective in June thirtieth. Yeah, gives us enough time. Three days. He wasn't taken to the town. Um, I think that. I got that on there. You you would need to you would need to have another meeting, um, to. Include the emergency management director as part of the fire chief's job description. I mean, I, we need to consult with legal counsel. Let's research that tomorrow and yeah. get back to us, Troy. Yeah. Okay. And we can con consult with you after that. Does that make sense, guys? Yep. Because I sit home and waiting for Troy's emails every day. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bob's replies. <laughs> Detroit by myself until they get busy. All right, you can investigate that. All right. Great. Thank you. Next, we have the personnel policy signature. Mr. Brown. All right, so this, I put this on the agenda. This, I'm not proposing any changes to the personnel policy, but as I'm leaving, I wanted to get the personnel policy up to date. We have, um, we have taken three actions on the personnel policy. We've sent out memos informing employees of this change, but I don't have an updated signed personnel policy it's in the package so as a recap i just wanted to make you aware of what action we have taken uh the first action was back in january 13th thir on the 13th of 2020 we went and we had an unfortunate situation we had a non-union employee pass unexpectedly and we went and updated our bereavement policy to reflect the same as the union policy and then um at the start of this year we had uh, life insurance that we've offered as a result of that same death that we started uh, the first of this year at the same level as all the uh, non-union employees at $25,000. Also, we had a two weeks notice that was required. If you submit your resignation, you're required to, uh, or you're required to give a two weeks notice. If you fail to do that, 
then any earn time that's owed to you will be reduced by 50%. So all of that you know, has been communicated with our staff, but it hasn't been updated in the policy. So, um, Did you highlight those, the changes in here? or they, They're not highlighted. They're, um, at the time that we did them, we had just that section, and, and, yep. and we that's all agreed on the language. Yep. And we yep. okay. I remember that. So now it's just in the consent. This will just give you a personnel policy now that's signed. We'll update it, in John, place. from the pers on the um, on our website and any new hires, and we'll probably circulate around all of our employees, make sure they have a fresh copy. Send it out, paper or electronically? Electronically. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not sure in the consent file if, remember that it's in if we all signed it or not. I haven't signed anything so for two Come weeks. Down. For two weeks. <laughs> Jim and I have always been here. Yeah, it's definitely in here. Yeah, so it'd be good to have all Pretty five much. signatures. That's it on that. Welcome. And I have nothing in the town administrator report. Nothing to in the report. town administrator <laughs> report. Okay, selectman reports. Ms. Greenan. Hey. <laughs> John's looking all serious. It's twice now. Yeah. <coughs> I flipped around the order a little bit because it was a dependency on something. So the National Re Regional Planning Commission had its quarterly meeting on September, oh, excuse me, on um, June 15th. The major takeaway other than budgets and all of that was um, they're now accepting projects for the 10-year transportation plan. And if you're going to put something on this list, the project deadline is August 5th, 2022. You have a Litchfield Route 3A Corning Road intersection where those townhomes are going. Uh, Jay believes would be a good candidate for that. Um, to apply for this, you need to do a cost estimate, so maybe another discussion. We'll get this on, the, on an agenda item. Um, you will need planning board and board of selectmen involvement, and it may require a 20% match by the town. You from Milford working there for a while, you know sometimes they get these transportation project grants. And then the voters say no for the 20% match, and they, they, they end up losing it. That's so right. Yep. They get pretty upset with that. Um, but Jay at NRPC thinks that some of the matching grants could also be available for that 20%. So the next regional planning commission meeting will be Wednesday, 20, uh, September 21st uh, at NRPC uh, office. As far as the planning board, we're not meeting on July 5th because of the holiday. We'll be meeting July 19th. Um, we'll continue our workshop on Albuquerque Ave. During our last meeting, uh, the planning board made a motion to support that Corning Road 3A intersection to be added to the 10-year tr transportation plan, but we wanted to pass it up to the Board of Selectmen. So I'll talk with you offline how you want to handle that, if it's an agenda item or whatever. Passing the buck, huh? No, I'll know. We have to, we have to have buy-in from both if you wanted to go forward. The DOT gets involved right off the bat, though. So, so can, can, can the uh, planning board actually specifically just request it? Or, I mean, or is it they said the official should. request need to come from the selectmen, or is it? Jay said both, but both. you want me to follow both. up? I will. I just was wondering how the. I see, yeah. Probably yeah. because the, you have to put money in for the cost estimate. Yeah. We use it. We it's I've been through this before. Document. We have to use two, the planning board or the planning committee, and then the selectmen back yeah. and getting going. I mean, officially, I mean, you're, you're going to want both selectmen and planning board, but yeah. I was just yeah. wondering, yeah. technically, can the planning board itself? request something on a 10-year plan without selectmen's I don't I know. input? Probably not. No. Well, yeah, there's a pretty, I guess they're putting in a real rigorous checkpoint to make sure those cost estimates are real, <laughs> you know, before they uh, continue going on with that. Uh, so we did talk about Albuquerque Ave, about initially painting intersections at Hillcrest and Pinecrest. Um, our resident, Mr. Charbonneau, was in the audience, and he gave us advice on ADA accessibility and cost. Um, the belief at this time from some of the members on the planning board is an enforcement issue than a planning board issue. Um, we're going to pass that on to the Board of Selectmen to realize that um, maybe we need more police present on Albuquerque. Um, as somebody on the planning board, we don't have any zoning ordinances to, to, to point to because the road's already built. So it really is enforcement, and then I'll get on to the next subject and maybe the next step. Um, we did acknowledge that improvements could be made near the high school because kids are trying to cross over the street to get there. Um, what we were told is we're currently working under an approved stamp sign-off set of drawings for that road. 
Any changes need to have a new stamp drawing from the traffic engineer or signage specialist due to liability concerns because it was said if somebody, if we added something and somebody was killed or really hurt, the liability would be on the town because we changed all the you know, signage and, and, and that, you know, any of that. So, <laughs> makes sense. I did read the letter um, that uh, Troy and I had worked on about an RPC, reaching out to them about Albuquerque Ave. Uh, about maybe they could rec recommend a professional firm to do an assessment that we currently have and then go forward with recommendations for today and future population growth, especially for new school, maybe going on that road as well. Uh, NRPC, you might see some of the line, they're doing counts, pedestrian and bike counts on Albuquerque. I'm not, I'm not sure if that'll be helpful or not, but we'll, we'll read that into the equation. So the NRPC is doing that? On Albuquerque, they're looking at pedestrian counts and bicycle counts. Okay. So jump on the so wire. It's all bike counts. <laughs> yeah. it's one, it's one right I've people. noticed those. Yeah. yeah. And I just wondered who was doing that. Yeah. It's kind of a slow week too because the kids were still in school and they're just getting out, but maybe the next week or two it'll pick up. Well, they've been there for a while though. Yeah. A couple weeks at least. Yeah. Let's see. I'm sure there's kids going along there and jumping on them. <laughs> 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 it'll be interesting what the count is, you know. There was a quick discussion during the planning board about impact fees to see if the road impact fees could be used for sidewalks. NRP thought they could be, <coughs> but they know that we're also working on the methodology for the current impact fees. So that, that's just an uh, open-ended question at this point. Um, Capital Improvement Plan Committee, um, I we, we would have met July 4th, holiday, so I believe we rescheduled to July 18th at the fire station. Um, and we'll just have that meeting then. No, it got it got canceled. Well, the library. Oh, the library. The too? library. Oh, so uh, so we're it, it it looks like we'll be on the August, whatever that is, August first. Ooh, we're running into a <laughs> a problem with budget committees and you know mm -hmm. coming the up. First, we meet the eighth. Yeah. So that's what that I have. Space, we can't with, re with respect to the Corning Road intersection. Yeah. Perhaps what was brought up tonight about the, the uh, speed of people on Corning, and I, I suppose a lot of those people are, are Manchester residents who are cutting across. They're Good point. Uh, there's a lot of down from the left hand side, Trolley Road, and all that's all Manchester. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, your truck traffic is high up there, too. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, just keep that in mind. I, I don't know if, the, if there's anything we can do, you know, but uh, uh. Well, I'll, I'll bring it to the attention of the police department and then I'm gonna reach out um, my notes here to the company that just did our street lights. Can we add one? And see if they can come out and do an assessment and add a street light or how you go about doing that. I think there is a street light at that intersection. I thought there was intersect. one there. I did too. Are so you talking about where the pole I think she's talking to yep. Acadia. I think it's down for it. The other streets down in Corning do not have street, street lights because the time they were built, yeah. the town did, didn't want them. Right. <laughs> Back in the 60s, I'll say that. There was no traffic to speak of. Yeah, I know. Things have changed now. It's like <coughs> said, heavy traffic and speed, and there's no street lights. Manchester has some, I believe, in this sector Probably down there. Do, right? But we have one at Corning. I think you have it at Corning the intersection of 3A and, and Charles Bancroft. I think as you get further in, it sounds like there's no street lights until you hit Manchester. And mm -hmm. there's none in London, London there you speak of until you London get the Litchfield there. Road. Yep. And those areas there, the other streets don't have them. Yep. Hmm. Well, there's been a lot of devel development in, in the Manchester <coughs> since. Yeah. So. <coughs> and that's the back way to get to Derry. All right, from our Recreation Commission, um, we have a meeting tomorrow night. I wasn't at the last meeting due to a softball game. So that's all coaching, but we'll have a meeting tomorrow night. School facility improvement, the last meeting was canceled. They canceled the next meeting in July also. Uh, yeah, in July also. We're not going to meet now until July 27th. We have a day that's right there. All right, budget committee met last week and I missed the meeting. The first one I missed in three years and I got tied up, and by the time I realized, it was already too late. 
I looked at my phone. I had messages from Mr. Sun and Mr. Cutter, and so I'm going to apologize to the board and the uh, budget committee for missing the meeting. Um, no excuse, and I'll take the heat from them when I see them. So if that happens two more times, you're kicked off. Okay, please. <laughs> Where are you going I do, <laughs> Troy, I'm glad you spoke. I have two <laughs> questions for you. Actually, it's partly three. Um, whereas you're going to be wrapping up here before the budget season starts. Will Karen be assisting with the budget process? So we're, we're working on the budget right now. Okay. And Karen's got the spreadsheets out to the departments. I just met with the police department today okay. and, and Karen. So we got that one going pretty good. And... Um, so the goal is to have have the budget pretty much done by the end of August, mm -hmm. um, like we've done in the past. Okay. And again, at that point in time, we're working with limited information, but mm -hmm. we'll, we will need to the basics have everything done. in place yeah. where that you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and at the next meeting, I want to talk to the board. You know, we'll take a look at the calendar and if if it, if there's any um, interest in and having trying to consolidate the budget committee meetings on the board of selectmen like like maybe the school did and but i don't know just to go you know it seems like we spend you know we we spend time having the department heads present the information we don't change a lot and then we do it all over again with the budget committee and would there be any benefit of mm -hmm. trying to do a, a, a joint presentation i i think I don't know. It, that, that's a good question. I think by the time we give the budget to the budget committee, we've already done our whittling, and I think they appreciate that and they know it because they see it. You know, yeah, they, they watch us perform. But yeah. this um, may not be the year to to, to do it. But no. it's. I, I know in in my analysis of anything, we spent as the board of selectmen. We spent a lot of time working mm -hmm. on budget, yes. and, and it takes away our ability to do other work. Yeah. You know from the start of the process all the way to March. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much our only focus. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really not that fond of the budget committee with the school doing it together. It's just, we have questions and it doesn't seem like we get, you know, a lot of, a lot of the answers that we're looking for. So um, personally, that's me. Some people love it. I don't. Um, the other questions were, um, <clears throat> Where we stand with the legal fee spending this year, because we're approximately 60% overspend halfway through the fiscal year. And regarding the police portion of the budget, we're currently tracking to overspend on part-time. Is this due, due to ongoing legal, or is there another cause? Um, those were the questions I had, and the other one was me asking. Okay. Okay. So if you could get that for me to get to... Mr. Sun and the rest of the budget committee, that'd be great. That's, no um, that's all I got. Okay, Mr. Lynch. Conservation Committee meets this next week, mm -hmm. the, the, the seventh. I'll be, be there. We'll start what happens. Okay, that's all I got. Mr. Lasalas. Um, the <coughs> Heritage Commission has, has not met. Um, the The emergency management we haven't had any but i'm just wondering um whether possibly we should incorporate the food pantry into the discussion with respect to emergency management um, and i i don't know if the food pantry is really equipped for possibilities you know uh, but it's just, I'm just thinking out loud here you'd have to get a hold of the deacons right at the church mm -hmm. yeah yeah I mean, they're, they're pretty well stocked but I mean there's gonna be people hurting this winter and they're gonna get they can get really taxed they're gonna get inundated yeah, yeah. So. I mean it's sad and we can't forget these people we no. just can't it's unexcusable to, to do that we got to make sure that we take care of those that are in need. So as a group, we probably should keep a close eye on it and see what we can do mm -hmm. to help out yep. if things start declining. Yep. And I talk to Linda Peoples a lot, so, I mean, she usually 
tells us what's going on if, if they need things and whatnot. You so want to do the liaison for us? I would love to do that. Yeah, thank you. Only because you asked me so nicely. <laughs> Are they the only food pantry in town? Yes. 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 Okay. I don't. I don't think Tabernacle has anything over there. I don't, I don't think so. I, 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 I am a so Francis think. Cook either. No. Yep. What was that backpack program for the school? <coughs> that came out of sixty-eight hours or something. Of hunger, yeah, to make sure they had food for the whole entire weekend. Is that a town? I right? think that was being spearheaded through the food pantry. It might have been. I think you could drop things off at the food pantry. There were a couple other people that were. Help facilitating it. So they they they're up I front. think they were part of it. Yeah. Okay. I just don't want to leave a food pantry. The Boy Scouts are collecting too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, as we get closer to the winter, we probably should keep that on our radar. Yeah. Anything else, Mr. Lasalas? Thank you. All right. We do have one other item this evening. It's a non-public session under RSA 91A colon 32A, compensation of any public employee. Do we have a motion to go into non-public? So moved. We have a motion by Mr. Leary. Second. We have a second by Mr. LaSalas. Roll call vote. Ms. Queenan. Yes. <laughs> I'm a yes. <laughs> you tricked her. I almost say Aye. here. <laughs> Mr. Lynch. Aye. Mr. LaSalas. Aye. The board is now entering a non-public session. <clears throat> While we do not anticip anticipate the need to return to public session following the non-public session for any reason other than to adjourn the meeting, we reserve the right to do so if the non-public session necessitates the board, board taking action in a public session. We are now entering non-public. Thank you for tuning in and everyone be well.